The 18th Decisive Battle of the World, Warsaw, 1920, by Viscount Dabenen. The 18th Decisive Battle of the World. Decisive Importance of the Battle of Warsaw. According to the Creasy computation, there were 15 decisive battles of the world before 1851. Since that date, two battles, Sedan and the Marne, would by general consent be entitled to rank on the required plane of importance. While neither of these brought conclusion to a campaign, and while neither was a contest between opposing civilizations, both may be held to rank as world events, through the profound influence they exercised on the political situation in Europe. The suggestion made in the present volume is that in 1920, a battle of equal importance to the human race was fought and won. A battle not less decisive than Sedan and the Marne in its influence on the culture of the world, on its science, religion, and political development. The decision as to what should be included in a list of world events, such as that established by Creasy, must be arbitrary. The selection will necessarily remain a legitimate subject of discussion and controversy. On this point, I am disposed to hold with the most impartial of historians, Halam, that the determining factor and final criterion should be whether a contrary event would have essentially varied the drama of the world. It cannot be disputed that Warsaw 1920 had many of the characteristics required for inclusion in such a category of greater magnitude. The civilizations in conflict were radically different. The objectives and methods of the combatants were violently opposed. It was in no sense an intertribal squabble but rather a trial of arms between two fundamentally divergent systems. Moreover, an immediate and so far an enduring peace was the result. It will be for the reader to judge, after pursual of the following pages, whether the claim of Warsaw is well founded. I have endeavored to set forth the facts and to narrate events with simplicity, avoiding emphasis and undue bias. Danger to civilization of Polish defeat. Other reasons for studying battle. Gibbon wrote in a tone which some have taken for regret. If Charles Martel had not checked the Saracen conquest at the Battle of Tours, the interpretation of the Koran would be taught at the schools of Oxford, and her pupils might demonstrate to a circumcised people the sanctity and truth of the revelation of Mahomet. The Battle of Tours was fought in A.D. 732. Language as strong would not be inappropriate to the events of 1920. Had Piłsudski and Weygand failed to arrest the triumphant advance of the Soviet army at the Battle of Warsaw, not only would Christianity have experienced a disastrous reverse, but the very existence of Western civilization would have been imperiled. The Battle of Tours saved our ancestors of Britain and our neighbors of Gaul from the yoke of the Koran. It is probable that the Battle of Warsaw preserved Central and parts of Western Europe from a more subversive danger, the fanatical tyranny of the Soviet. The victory of Charles Martel has been termed one of those signal deliverances which affect for centuries the happiness of mankind. The Polish victory of August 1920 has an equal, in some ways perhaps, a superior title to honor. For the civilization endangered was of a far higher order. Compared with it, the century of Charles Martel was barbarous. In 1920, the setback entailed by defeat would have been incomparably graver. While the host of Abderrahman were inspired by fierce religious zeal, they had an ordered state and enjoyed a high degree of culture. The enemies of the Poles had no ambition but to set class against class, no creed but destruction of the existent order, no policy but to annihilate all that stands for our conception of religion, justice, and good faith. Other historical comparisons are not less instructive. The struggle between East and West has continued through 2,000 years. The dividing line between the civilizations of Asia and Europe is usually fixed at Suez. Historical reasons plead rather for establishing the essential division at the 20th meridian east of Greenwich. For it is on that meridian, or in close proximity to it, that the most decisive battles between the two civilizations have been contested. The most famous of these, Marathon and Salami are indeed recognized as turning points in world history. Had the god of battle determined the issue in those days in favor of the hosts of the Persian king, there would have been little Greek culture or civilization. The Greek spirit of individual freedom would have been crushed under oriental despotism. Greek intellectual curiosity would have been stifled under Asiatic immobility, 
Europe would have lacked the primary source of her literary and artistic inspiration. Lepanto was hardly less decisive. Had the Turkish fleet prevailed over the combined forces of Christendom, Europe might well have been overrun by barbarous hordes from Asia Minor and reduced to the sterile nakedness of all lands which fell under the devastating rule of the Ottoman sultans. In 1684, the Ottoman invasion made its furthest advance west. The Battle of Vienna was one of the occasions when Europe owed safety to Polish valor. Already at Hochim in 1621, Polish arms attained an important victory over Asiatic assailants, but the danger was even more grave before the walls of Vienna, and John Sobieski earned the gratitude of all who value the maintenance of European civilization. It is difficult to estimate the relative importance of these events in the 10th and 17th centuries as compared with the Battle of Warsaw in our own time, but the surmise is justifiable that in its influence on the civilization of Europe, the victory before the walls of Warsaw in 1920 was no less vital than the historical contests in which Poland in earlier years acted as a bulwark to the West. On the essential point, there is little room for doubt. Had the Soviet forces overcome Polish resistance and captured Warsaw, Bolshevism would have spread throughout Central Europe and might have well penetrated the whole continent. In every large city of Germany, secret preparation had been made by communist agents. A definite program had been prepared. Leaders had been chosen. Lists of victims had been drawn up. Undermining intrigue would have been followed by ruthless assassination and murder. There is abundant evidence that the Moscow government, in concentrating their forces upon Poland, had views extending far beyond the capture of Warsaw. Their ambition, their confident expectation of victory, extended to the countries west of the Vistula and beyond the Polish frontier. The circumstances were peculiarly favorite to the revolution. The minds of men were so weakened by the terrific strain of the years of war that they had become a ready prey to any subversive doctrine. The old order, which had landed the world in so grave a catastrophe, had lost authority. Something different must be resorted to. Bolshevism had not yet proved its incapacity it was still a gospel of hope. To set against the propagandist zeal of the Bolsheviks, there was on the side of Western European civilization nothing but a divided camp. The Great War had imbued nations, notably France and Germany, with so bitter a mutual hatred that joint action between them was outside the pale of possibility. The foundations of Western civilization might be menaced. Ex-enemies could not combine in its defense. Distrust made them oblivious of their common beliefs. Suspicion and hatred were their counselors. Diplomacy was as yet powerless to bridge the gulf. Among them, the working classes, political opinion was animated rather by sympathy for the Soviet doctrine than by aversion. Moscow propaganda had worked with persistence. Large sections of the population were contaminated. Even among the classes hostile to fundamental change, there was no adequate grasp of the appalling danger to civilization which threatened. The Russian upheaval was regarded as an historical event similar to the French Revolution of 1789, destined infallibly and at no distant date to end in a return to imperial or bourgeois rule. The fanatical zeal which communism inculcates and inspires was not understood by any save those who had come into close contact with it, nor was the fact appreciated that an avowed and organized attempt to set class against class had been initiated by propagandists in Moscow. Apart from the dire peril which it warded off, there is a second reason which imparts interest and attraction to the Battle of Warsaw. In few other campaigns have the great principles of strategy been brought into such clear relief as in the battle which was fought in the central districts of Poland in August 1920. It was not a question of confused fighting without appreciable advantage to one side or the other. No painful inch was gained or lost in the swaying of uncertain combat. No forlorn hope, no desperate resistance. Daring strategy determined the fate of the forces immediately engaged and sealed at one stroke the issue of the whole campaign. A subsidiary circumstance of unquestionable interest to the technical student is the fact that each of the commanders-in-chief has written a full account of his thoughts and actions both before and during the battle, together with his reflections after the event. Moreover, 
One of them has written a criticism of the actions of his opponent with a frankness unprecedented in military history. There is thus full material for the examination of rival theories and their execution. A further reason which may be adduced, which renders the study of this historical episode a subject of exceptional interest for military readers. This is the clear deduction to be drawn from the events of August 1920. We now know that a situation can hardly be so compromised as to be beyond remedy if strategical genius is allowed fair scope. Since the situation in which the Polish forces stood on the 12th of August could be converted into a Polish victory by the 20th of August, what reason is there to despair in any conceivable situation? Nothing could appear more certain than that the Soviet forces would capture Warsaw either by direct attack or by encirclement from the south. No doubt crossed the mind of the Russian commander Tukhachevsky that the victory lay within his grasp. The Polish forces had been driven back for six continuous weeks at the average rate of 10 miles a day, and their commanders had lost confidence in any possibility of recovery. Tukhachevsky describes them as dispirited and disorganized. Piłsudski, in taking command of the forces that eventually achieved a brilliant victory, declared that he had never seen such a parcel of ill-equipped ragamuffins. Many of them, indeed, had not even boots. Should it not be an inspiration to military commanders, faced with probable defeat, to remember that in circumstances more perilous and less hopeful than their own, a resounding victory was attained? Before entering upon the narrative of events which preceded the supreme days around Warsaw, I should perhaps explain how I was brought into this theater of action. In the month of June 1920, I was appointed His Britannic Majesty's Ambassador in Berlin. After presenting my letters of credence, I was summoned to the Spa Conference, having spent only four or five days in Berlin. At Spa, great apprehension was felt by the representatives of the Allies at reports of Polish disasters on the Russian frontier, followed by a precipitate retreat. The Polish government applied for assistance both to Paris and London. Grabski, the Polish Minister of Finance, who was present at Spa, urged in impassioned terms the necessity for immediate support. It was soon agreed between Mr. Lloyd George and the French Prime Minister that the best method of assistance was not only to dispatch munitions to Warsaw, but to send an Anglo-French mission composed of diplomatic and military elements. On our return to London from Spa, the Prime Minister requested me to undertake this mission on the diplomatic side, General Radcliffe being the English military delegate. Before starting for Warsaw via Paris, Mr. Lloyd George agreed on my urgent request to allow Sir Maurice Hankey, secretary to the cabinet, to join the mission. We left London on the 20th July for Paris, the French government having indicated its agreement with the despatch of the mission, but not having yet named its representatives. The following were the terms of the official decision that Lord Dabenon, the British ambassador, in Berlin, accompanied by a military officer to be nominated by the Army Council, should be invited to proceed to Poland in conjunction with a similar French mission as a special envoy to advise His Majesty's government as to the measures to be taken with the Polish and other governments on questions arising out of the negotiations with regard to the conclusion of an armistice between Poland and Soviet Russia. Apart from advising the two governments on questions of a negotiation, it was clearly understood that we had to assist the Polish government in defending their country from the menace of attack. It was indeed obvious that if Warsaw fell, there could be no successful negotiation. Immediately on our arrival in Paris, we were received by Monsieur Milron, who at once agreed to lend wholehearted cooperation to the mission. He nominated General Weigand as the military member and later in the day appointed Mr. Jusseron, the French ambassador in Washington, as the civilian representative on the mission, adding Monsieur Vignon, his own chef de joint de cabinet.
Visit to Paris. Diary, Paris, 22nd July, 1920. Since arriving here, in addition to official interviews, we have conversed with a number of private individuals who are considered likely to throw light on the position at Warsaw. The most prominent of these is Paderewski, long one of the most distinguished pianists of Europe and lately Prime Minister of Poland. If our impression of the position of Warsaw was dark before we discussed matters with this artistic genius, it was notably more gloomy after our interview. His main advice was that the mission should on no account omit to be accompanied by aeroplanes. Ordinary prudence demanded that we should be provided with means to facilitate our escape in the almost certain event of the capture of Warsaw by the Soviet. Even allowing for the fact that this warning came from a political rival of those now in power at Warsaw, it proceeded from one who knew local conditions well and was not conductive to confidence in the possible success of our mission. Prince Leon Radziwiłł, a Polish nobleman resident in Paris, who had distinguished himself with the Polish Legion during the war, was more reassuring. He held the view that it was not too late to organize a successful resistance to the Russian advance. His confidence in the position was such that he offered to come to Poland himself and to assist the mission with his advice. This project he was not able to carry out, but the views he gave regarding Poland and regarding the whole situation in Central Europe were more correct and far-seeing than those received from any other source. His fundamental view was that the Czechoslovakians were essentially Slav and would in the last resort fall in with the Russian program, being infinitely closer to Panslavism than the Poles. It was therefore vain to look for assistance from them. From Germany, there was even less chance of help. It was even doubtful whether the ordinary facilities of transport would be given. In special train from Paris to Warsaw, 23rd July, 1920, we have decided not to accept the advice of the ex-Polish premier with regard to aeroplanes. But we have adopted the more practical plan of traveling in a special train and living on board in the station of Warsaw. We shall thus escape the publicity of noisy hotels and not burden our respective diplomatic representatives with a heavy charge of hospitality. This plan has the ancillary advantage of affording a ready means of withdrawal in case of need. The train arrangements have been admirably carried out by the French authorities and all has gone fairly smoothly on our passage through Germany. Views held in Prague Prague 24th July, 1920. A fortunate accident to our locomotive has compelled a stoppage of four or five hours, which has been turned to advantage by my French colleague. As an old friend of President Masaryk, he at once decided to seize the opportunity of an interview with the statesman enjoying the highest reputation for sagacity in Central Europe. We were thus able to gain an intimate knowledge of the Polish position as it appeared to the most competent advisers of a neighboring state. If Paderewski had been gloomy in his views of the situation, the Czechoslovakian president was even more so. Not only did he consider the capture of Warsaw by the Bolshevik army a matter of uncertainty, but he warned us against organizing any military assistance to the Poles on two grounds. It was certain to be completely ineffective in a military sense and it was liable to destroy the authority of the Western powers in the subsequent negotiations for peace. By openly siding with the Poles in their hopeless position, we would do them no good and we should do ourselves much harm. Advice from so authoritative a quarter could not but make a certain impression on our minds. But no other course was open to us than to carry out the instructions we had received. The interview with Masaryk was by far the most important event in our short stay in Prague. Conversations with other persons opened our eyes to the fact that in Central Europe enjoyed a large amount of sympathy throughout the working classes. The popularity of communism appears not to be affected either by the monstrous behavior of the Bolsheviks and their outstanding cruelty, nor by the complete failure of their economic administration. The feeling is more akin to an instinctive religious bias than to a reasoned political opinion. Present conditions are bad. Bolshevism opens the door to complete change. Therefore, it should be followed. We also saw evidence that when there is money for nothing else in Moscow, there is money for propaganda, 
and great skill is shown in inoculating discontented classes with a new gospel of hope. Arrival in Warsaw Warsaw, 25th July, 1920. We arrived in Warsaw this morning. The English and French ministers accredited to the Polish government met us at the station, together with a very small deputation from the Polish ministry. The tone of the reception was civil, but hardly cordial and certainly not enthusiastic. Driving through the town from the station to the British legation, my first impression was that of surprise at the normal aspect of the population. In the streets, there was no sign of alarm or panic, no indication that the manhood of the country had been called upon for a supreme effort and was absent on military service. The proportion of the sexes appeared quite normal. The only abnormal feature was the extreme frequency of religious processions. We were held up by these at every street corner. No time was lost in getting to work, and by 10 o'clock the English members of the mission were in close conference with three English general officers who had arrived from Berlin and Danzig. The situation in which we found Poland on our arrival was one of extreme peril. The Bolshevik army had advanced 300 miles from the Dwina after their first success in the beginning of July, and was still driving the Polish army before it. Or, to speak more correctly, the Bolsheviks were maneuvering the Polish army back by infiltration, outflankings, and turning movements. From the beginning of the retreat, there had been no serious resistance. The Bolshevik forces were now only 100 miles from Warsaw, nor was there any physical obstacle to impede their further advance. The Polish army, which in the month of June had brought off several successful attacks, was now discouraged and appeared incapable of serious resistance. If it is impossible to avoid criticism of the fighting capacity of the Poles during the retreat from the Dvina to the Vistula, it is essential to remember that this army had been created in the early months of 1919 and was therefore only between a year and 18 months old at the time of the events here narrated. It was recruited in the main from disconnected and opposed elements who had been fighting during the Great War, not together, but against one another. It is on record that in the course of the Great War, 700,000 Poles were mobilized in the Russian army, 300,000 in the German, and 300,000 in the Austrian army. Further constituents of the Polish army were legionnaires and revolutionaries who had been fighting on one side or the other without any lasting affiliation. From such elements, was it possible that a united or disciplined force could be improvised in the course of just a few months? It has further to be remembered that the Polish leaders had held during the war violently divergent views, some being animated by special fear and hatred of Germany, others again by special fear and hatred of Russia. A further large section was inspired by a special predilection for France. The previous history of Poland did not inspire confidence in the possibility of rapid organization for concentrated effort. Poland, the Niobe of nations, had not appeared on the map of Europe during the hundred years which had preceded the Great War. The whole territory which formed the ancient kingdom of Poland, which now forms the Polish Republic, having been divided for the fourth time in 1815 by the Treaty of Vienna and attributed to the three great empires, Russia, Germany and Austria. During the hundred years since 1815, Poland was a patriotic aspiration. It was not a geographical state, nor was it an independent, autonomous state. That the Polish army under such conditions should have had any cohesion is a subject for surprise and admiration. In the spring of 1920, the military authorities of Poland, taking advantage of the fact that the Russian forces were engaged in repelling attacks on three fronts by Wrangel, the Nikin, and Kolczak, pushed forward far beyond any line contemplated by the powers and captured Kiev with the surrounding districts. The result of aggressive action was that the Poles were spread over a long line of 1,000 kilometers with insufficient forces. They were far from their base of supplies and had quite inadequate facilities of lateral communication along their front, no reserves and no power of concentration. The natural reaction was that as soon as the Moscow authorities had disposed of Kolchak and Denikin, they determined not only to eject the Poles from what they considered Russian territory, but to capture Warsaw and export their doctrines beyond the Vistula. Trotsky, amid loud applause from the Communist Congress, formally proclaimed that he would destroy bourgeois Poland and carry the proletariat revolution far to the west. 
it may be regarded as certain that from July 1920 all negotiations entered into by the Soviet, under pretext that they were prepared to make peace with Poland, were little more than a blind. They were designed with a view both to gain time for military advance and to give an opportunity for subversive propaganda in Poland to bear fruit. Among the erroneous ideas entertained by the Western powers, none was more dangerous than their belief that peace was possible with the Soviet. The Russian authorities were confident of their power to destroy the Polish army and capture Warsaw. They would treat seriously after that had been done and not before. The Polish government, while less credulous than the Western powers regarding the good faith of Soviet negotiators, made the grave mistake of estimating Russian military force in July 1920 as only equal to Russian military force a few months before. Earlier in the year, Russia was engaged on other fronts, but in July the Russian force available for the attack on Poland had been strengthened not only by the troops set free by the termination of hostilities with the Nikin, Wrangel and Kolczak, but by prisoners taken from these three armies, enrolled forcibly or willingly into the Soviet army. Military efficiency was moreover increased by large additions of matériel acquired in the interval. In July 1920, the Russian forces were both larger and better equipped than the Poles. A further circumstance favored the Russian advance. Moscow disposed of a host of spies, propagandists, secret emissaries and secret friends who penetrated into Polish territory and undermined the resistance of certain elements of the Polish population. In the astounding advance during July 1920, when the Russian army drove the Poles back over 400 miles in 40 days, the services rendered by the unarmed were not less effective than those brought about by military pressure. The system adopted was to avoid frontal attack whenever possible and to turn positions by flank marches, infiltration and propaganda. In vain, the Poles attempted to hold positions at various strategic points. In every case, they were compelled to retire after a brief resistance, the chief result of ineffective fighting being increased demoralization. As the Russian army advanced, they were welcomed in many towns with friendliness by sections of the population attracted by their doctrines. If there was no general uprising favorable to them in the districts east and north of Warsaw, this is possibly due to the fact that the population in these parts is mainly agricultural. A more dangerous welcome might have to be recorded had the Soviet forces reached the manufacturing districts. Throughout communistic circles in Europe, the initial success of the Bolsheviks had aroused immense excitement in the early days of August 1920. Little doubt was felt that Warsaw would fall before the middle of the month and that this success would only be the prelude to the victory of Bolshevism in Prague and Berlin. The advanced socialist parties, both in France and England, protested vigorously against assistance being given to the Poles in defense of their territory either by the dispatch of troops or supplies. The Humanité of 7th August declared, not a man, not a halfpenny, nothing for capitalistic Poland. In England, even sober political leaders, as was made clear in the House of Commons debate of 10th August, had only one preoccupation, to keep clear whether or not Warsaw fell and communism triumphed. The Second Congress of the Communist Third International, which sat in Moscow from 19th July to 7th August 1920, laid down in 21 points the conditions which it would impose upon the old world after its victory. It proclaimed the sovereign authority of the Third International and engaged to destroy all those who refused to recognize it. The democracies of the world must be subjugated and all working class fractions who remained outside the Universal Communist Party must be suppressed. Meanwhile, the Bolshevik commander Tukhachevsky was so confident of victory that he paid little attention to the maneuvers and movements of the Polish forces who opposed him. That Warsaw would fall was a foregone conclusion. The only doubt was how far beyond Warsaw victory would carry him. How complete would be the disintegration of Poland? To what other countries would disintegration extend? What would be the world reverberation of the confidently expected victory?
While the political importance of battles is by no means to be measured by the numbers of the combatants, the reader will probably desire at this stage some estimate of the strength of the respective armies. Various figures have been put forward, both by Russian and Polish authorities professing to give the number of combatants on each side during the 1920 campaign. But the data are so uncertain and the bias of compilers so obvious that no confidence can be felt in any precise figure. On a review of the various authorities available, I incline to the opinion that the bayonet and saber strength was approximately equal, being in the neighborhood of 150,000 in each army. At the commencement of operations on 1st July, the Soviet force was probably stronger, but as they advanced west, their numbers dwindled, whereas recruits joined the Polish army, particularly after the retreat had reached Poland proper. It seems possible that on 1st July the Russian fighting force exceeded the Polish force by some 30,000 men, while the Poles exceeded the Russians by a similar number between the 13th and 20th of August. The total number of Russian soldiers captured by the Poles amounted to 66,000, while the number who were driven over the Prussian frontier and there disarmed is estimated at 44,000. Regarding the killed and wounded, no reliable estimate has been formed of the Russian losses. The Polish losses are given as 50,000 killed and wounded during the whole course of the operations of 1920. Position in which we found Poland. Warsaw, 25th July, 1920. This afternoon, together with Yusserand, I called upon Prince Sapiecha, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and introduced the mission. Sapiecha welcomed us with cordiality and set forth the position with great frankness and a complete absence of panic. He admitted that the Polish left was badly broken and that there were no reserves to prevent the Bolshevik advance from Grodno on Warsaw. On other fronts farther south, the Polish forces were resisting better. Sapiecha informed us that while negotiations are going on re an armistice, his confidence in the success of these is shaken by a Russian telegram the Poles intercepted yesterday, ordering a general attack. The Polish Minister of Foreign Affairs gave me the impression of sincerely desiring peace. The non-conciliatory spirit is thought in some quarters to animate the Polish government being notably absent. Later in the day, I had received an interview with the chief of the state, Piłsudski, who said the greatest service the mission could render Poland was to keep the communications through Danzig open. Poland is in urgent need of supplies, but this was not all. The importance of keeping the road open was not only material, but moral. He attached more importance to supplies than to military assistance in the form of either advice or foreign officers. Position in Russia Warsaw, 26th July, 1920. Since arrival here yesterday, the English members of the mission have spent much time in conference with English general officers now stationed in Berlin and Danzig, who have been sent to inform us on the present position so far as it comes within their special competence. The advice they give is much to the point. It leads to the conclusion that the project of transferring German munitions of war to Poland is impracticable. As under the Treaty of Versailles these munitions have to be destroyed, they also advise that, even if this were practicable, the German railway workers would refuse to handle the goods. It would also be useless to press for increased facilities in the transmission of arms destined to supplement Polish supplies. The only practical course is to keep the Danzig route open, and on this I decided to concentrate. If it is achieved, Polish necessities can be met. General Hacking, who is commanding the troops at Danzig, is confident that if he is given a free hand, he can solve the unloading difficulty at the port. Firmness is requisite, but with firmness success can be attained. If necessary, English soldiers might be deployed to get the goods unloaded. In the afternoon of yesterday, Yusserand and I had an interview with Grabski, the able minister of finance, and found him far from satisfied with the action that is being taken by the Polish government. We drew his attention to the apparent failure on the part of the military authorities to take advantage of General Wagen's presence. I was particularly insistent on the immense value to Poland of Wagen's unrivaled experience and of his capacity for military organization. To this Grabski did not say much, 
but it appeared from the conversation, and it has been confirmed from other sources, that Marshal Piłsudski, the head of the state and commander-in-chief of the Polish army, is opposed to deferring to Weygand. He holds that warfare in the east is quite different from warfare in Flanders. The kind of experience which might be required would be that of an English colonial general. Whether there is much in this criticism may be doubted, but Piłsudski has immense authority here and a greater knowledge of local conditions than anybody. Apart from the reasons openly stated, there is doubtless in the minds of many Polish military leaders a prejudice against foreign officers. They do not want their own powers curtailed and fear lest any privilege which may accrue should go to others. Moreover, there is the language difficulty, which has a very real importance. In the evening, we dined with the Prince Sapieha at the Club de Chaussures to meet the ministers. While they were reticent and discreet, it is unclear that they are convinced of the desirability of using Weygand, but they cannot overcome the resistance of the head of the state, Piłsudski. I continue to marvel at the absence of panic, at the apparent absence, indeed, of any anxiety. The advance line of the Bolsheviks is not more than 100 miles distant from Warsaw. Were a methodical system of defense being organized by the Polish government against attack from the north, the confidence of the public might be understood. But so far from this being the case, all their best troops are being sent to the south to defend Lwów, leaving Warsaw unprotected. In the north, they have a sick general in command who admits that he has lost his nerve and declares openly for an immediate peace. This diversion of the best troops to the south is sometimes explained by the rumor that intercepted messages between Russian commanders indicate that the main Russian attack will be on that front. I have no belief in the truth of this explanation. The best information regarding the Bolshevik army does not describe it as either enthusiastic or efficient. Its superiority consists in the officers and in the fact that they have had longer experience of working together than the Poles. The stories about German ex-officers occupying important posts are denied. The Russians have neither many aeroplanes nor heavy artillery, but they are better equipped with machine guns than the Poles. Warsaw, 27th July, 1920. A further meeting with the English generals this morning. No explanation was forthcoming of the apparent absence of proper measures of defense against attack from the north nor was there any further indication that the Polish government are inclined to utilize to the full the services of General Weygand. I talked matters over with Jusron and suggested that we should press the Polish authorities to sink their susceptibilities and take advantage of the presence here of so distinguished a commander. Jusron, however, urged that it would be better to wait 24 hours, his reason being that Weygand himself is anxious not to have anything done which would be offensive to General Henri. This officer is the head of the resident French military mission and was until our arrival the advisor to the Polish government on military matters. Personally, I am not disposed to stand on ceremony with so grave a crisis threatening. Henri has been here some time and has evidently failed to make good his authority and prestige with the Polish government. He is said to be completely dominated by Pusutski while the French mission, as a whole, has not attained a success in any way comparable with the French achievement in other countries. General Henri is said to have encouraged the rash Polish advance in the spring of 1920, and now finds all sorts of futile excuses for what has turned out to be a disastrous move. The more I see of Weygand, the more I am impressed by him. Calm, clear, precise. At 3 p.m. today, a telegram arrived from London announcing that the Soviet government was ready to negotiate a favorable armistice with Poland. This news came as a surprise here and is not generally credited. The expectation has been that the Soviet would drag an armistice negotiations while their troops advanced. When it came to signing, the demands would be so excessive as to be unacceptable. However, this may be, it appears essential as far as the mission is concerned, not to allow any rumor of negotiation to diminish activity in organizing defense. One cannot but be struck here with the apparent want of methodical resolution, both on the civil and military side. Even more remarkable is the outstanding insouciance of everybody while the enemy is at the gates of the capital. The prime minister, a peasant proprietor, has gone off today to get his harvest in. Nobody thinks this extraordinary.
Warsaw, 27th July, 1920. Later, unless an armistice is concluded within a few days, it will be necessary to evacuate Warsaw and form a new base either at Posen or Krakow. My strong view is in favor of Posen on account of its proximity to Danzig and the greater facility for maintaining communication with the sea. Weigand and Radcliffe are telegraphing to Paris and London urging the dispatch via Danzig of the matériel required by the Polish army. The present supplies are very defective. They require signaling apparatus, arms and ammunition, and even more urgently, they require aeroplanes. Jedzie, jedzie na kasztance, na kasztance, siwy strzelca strój. Siwy strzelca strój. Hej, hej, komendancie miły wodzu mój. Hej, hej, komendancie miły wodzu mój. Gdzie szabelka twarze stali, twarze stali, przecież idzie w bój. Przecież idzie w bój. Komendancie miły wodzu mój Hej, hej, komendancie miły wodzu mój Sketch of Piłsudski, Warsaw, 28th July, 1920 The dominant personality here is unquestionably Marshal Piłsudski, head of the state and commander-in-chief of the army. An astounding career, seven years in Siberia and a good many months on other occasions in various Russian prisons. An ardent patriot and a man of immense courage and force of character. A pronounced skeptic about orthodox methods, whether applied to military affairs or politics. He loves danger, his pulse only beating at a normal rate when he is in imminent personal peril, at other times at 40 to the minute. It appears so striking as to be almost theatrical. None of the usual amenities of civilized intercourse, but all the apparatus of somber genius. He claims that in actual fighting his methods, though unusual and not in conformity with textbook practice, have invariably proved successful. Next to danger, he is said to love intrigue. A revolutionary by temperament and circumstance, his ingrained proclivity is to the secret and the indirect. On the present occasion this will not facilitate the work of the mission, to harmonize Vagan's tempered, orderly methods of organization with the wild practice of a conspirator and an ex-leader of irregular levies appears hardly possible. The Polish ministers who theoretically are supposed to advise him possess in truth little real influence on authority. Indeed, he definitely prefers to act in opposition to their counsel. It is noticeable that he has gained a complete ascendancy over the foreign military officers who have been brought into contact with him. General Henri is a devotee and the head of the British military mission. General Carton de Vier, a man of marked independence of judgment, is fascinated by this strange Polish phenomenon. If it is asked to what political party Piłsudski belongs, the answer is somewhat difficult. In the early days he was accounted a socialist and unquestionably had close relations with the socialist leaders and others even more to the left. Moreover, seven years of Siberia are sufficient to give any man a right of comradeship in advanced socialism. But in November 1918, when he had already become head of the Polish state, and his main object, if one of personal ambition had been accomplished, he received a socialist deputation who came to greet Comrade Piłsudski in the following terms. Gentlemen, I am no longer your comrade. In the beginning we followed the same direction and took the tramway painted red, but I left it at the station, Poland's independence. You are continuing the journey as far as the station, socialism. My good wishes accompany you, but be so kind as to call me sir. The fact is that in each and all of the numerous parties which compose Polish political life, Piłsudski has devoted friends and bitter enemies. No party as a whole is for him or against him, except indeed the National Democrats of the right, who have been constantly adverse and whose principal papers have continued to criticize and ridicule Piłsudski even when head of the state. 
It will be seen that it is difficult to classify Piłsudski among military leaders. Whose principles of strategy does he follow? To what school does he belong? In his book on the year 1920, he himself declares that he belongs to no school except to one which he calls that of open-air strategy, la stratégie de plein air. The words are given in French in the Polish text. By this he means that his method is not that of employing great masses, for he did not possess them, nor is it the strategy of combined action with troops in close formation, nor is it the strategy of trench warfare, for he constructed no trenches. He claims that his consistent series of victories has been obtained by methods in which the troops moved freely in large spaces, strategy in which le groupe, le coq de bois, les élans, et les lièvres peuvent se mouvoir librement sans nuire à l'œuvre de guerre, à l'œuvre de la victoire. Further diary in Warsaw, 27th July to 13th of August. Warsaw, 27th July, 1920. A satisfactory meeting took place this evening between the Anglo-French mission and the defense committee of the Polish cabinet. The principal step decided upon was that General Wagen's services should be utilized to the full and that he should be assisted by General Ratcliffe. It was thought preferable that Wagen should not be made titular chief of the staff, but that he should act as an advisor to the Polish chief of the staff, with full access to all papers, orders, etc. It was understood and accepted by all present that his views would receive the fullest consideration. The question of what generals to appoint to the commands in the field is one of unusual difficulty. The officer corps is divided into three sections old Austrian officers, old Russian officers, and officers with German training. The jealousy between these three sections is such as to render cooperation difficult. The ministers assure us that efficiency will be the only guide in the appointments made. They go on to add that only one general has hitherto been excluded for private reasons, namely General Dovbor, a man of recognized capacity but a rival and enemy of Piłsudski. He is now at Posen and expected shortly at Warsaw. My apprehension that the telegram from London stating that the Soviet had agreed to a London conference would lead the Poles to relax war preparation was groundless. The leading men here attach no importance whatsoever to any Soviet acceptance of a London conference, being convinced that the terms of any armistice that the Soviet proposed would be quite unacceptable. The French take the same view. The Polish ministers expect that Soviet peace terms will involve 1. Reduction or disbandment of the army 2. The establishment of some form of Soviet government in Poland Neither of these conditions would they agree to discuss. A third anticipated demand from the Soviet is the release of communist prisoners in Poland. This appears to present less difficulty. Warsaw, 29th July, 1920 General Hacking has displayed great energy at Danzig. He reports favorably regarding the possibility of sending supplies to Poland through that port. This news has greatly cheered the Polish government and is warmly appreciated by the public here. The opinion is widely held that the mere fact of keeping the Danzig route open will have a determining influence on the armistice negotiations. Personally, I am more than ever skeptical about the armistice. It is clear that the Russians are confident of capturing Warsaw. 
It is also clear that if Warsaw is captured, Moscow can demand much better terms than they can put forward today. London appears to me too much inclined to believe in the possibility of an immediate arrangement with the Soviet government. What would the Soviet gain thereby? Warsaw, 30th July, 1920. It has been raining here steadily for the last 48 hours, a somewhat favorable circumstance as it will delay the Russian advance. But the situation remains critical. General Radcliffe has just returned from the front near Białystok. He found the morale of the Polish troops better than he expected, but the Russian cavalry, estimated at 8,000, continually outflanks the Polish left, and the Poles continue to retreat. Wagand finds great difficulty in inducing the Polish general staff to devote enough troops to the northern front. They have an idea that the final frontier in Galicia will depend upon the line between the armies at the precise date of the armistice. It is therefore necessary to defend with energy all territory in the south. The frontier on the north will be determined on ethnographical lines. The precise position there on the day of the armistice is consequently less important. How far this is true may be doubtful. The practical result of holding it is that the Poles expose their heart at Warsaw while endeavoring to protect their feet in the south. The probability that Warsaw will have to be evacuated in a few days increases. Warsaw, 31st July, 1920. The Russians have advanced from Grodno and are now halfway between that town and Warsaw. Moscow does not pay the smallest attention to the admonitions from London that any military advance throws doubt on the bona fide desire for peace. A telegram from Danzig states that a Spartacist demonstration of some 8,000 people has taken place there to protect against taxation and to demand better food. The police eventually restored order, but this demonstration is an indication that Bolshevik propaganda is making converts in these parts. Demonstrations in other towns may be expected. Warsaw, 31st July, 1920. Sir Maurice Hankey left last night for London. He will report fully to the cabinet on the position. It would be impossible to speak too highly of the assistance he has given. A man of excellent judgment with an untiring capacity for work. Warsaw, 1st August, 1920. We have now been here about a week, and I have been able to form a fairly clear impression of the position. It is not exhilarating. When we arrived, we found the army thoroughly disorganized with very inadequate supplies of materiel. Not only was the army insufficient in strength, but it was a wasting asset. There were numerous stragglers and deserters. The latter are estimated by some at as many as 100,000 out of a total nominal strength of 300,000, but there is no means of checking these figures. It appears, however, certain that up till recently the Provost Marshal's department has been extremely lax. Polish officers contrast undue leniency in this direction with Soviet severity, which has succeeded in rounding up vast numbers of recruits. As regards the deficiency in military supplies in Poland, there was, when we arrived here, no route open by which these supplies could be obtained from France and England. Such was the situation. Today, things still look critical, though somewhat better. The Bolshevist army has indeed made a further advance, but the Polish army shows signs of organizing for increased resistance. Energetic measures have been taken to collect stragglers and deserters. Officers who fail to do their duty are court-martialed without mercy, and the dispatch of supplies to the front has been accelerated. The Allies may fairly claim that a considerable portion of the improvement is due to the arrival of the Franco-British mission, particularly to the presence of General Wagand. Even allowing in ample measure for the improvement achieved by the Poles themselves, plus the effect of Wagand, the capacity of the Polish army to make a stand against the vigorous advance of the Bolsheviks must not be exaggerated. The chances remain strongly against the possibility of holding Warsaw. If Warsaw has to be evacuated, I have urged the government to make a stand based on Posen and to fight on from there. Their original idea was rather to fall back on Krakow, but apart from the fact 
that the Posen population is tougher than that in the south, there is this dominant consideration that Posen is much closer to Danzig and can be more easily supplied with provisions through Danzig, whereas it would be easy for the Bolsheviks to cut communications between Danzig and Krakow. Against this argument, Polish ministers are inclined to advocate a retirement on Krakow, believing that the Czechoslovaks are more friendly to them than the Germans. Personally, I do not attach much importance to this belief, for I am convinced that the Czech population, apart from its leaders, is more friendly to the Bolsheviks than to the Poles. The German government, though assuredly not friendly to the Poles, distrusts Bolshevism. The question of how to get munitions of war through Poland from the West is one of immense difficulty. On the ground or on the pretext that they must maintain strict neutrality, Austria, Czechoslovakia and Germany have refused to allow trains laden with munitions to come through. This has been done partly because the workers themselves are of communistic tendency and might refuse to allow the traffic to pass even if ordered to do so by their governments. No one who has not been here can realize the extent to which sympathy with Bolsheviks dominates the working classes in Central Europe. This sympathy is almost more religious than political. It is unaffected by ordinary considerations of interest and survives the complete failure of Bolshevik economic administration, no less than their admitted brutality and cruelty. Warsaw, 2nd August, 1920. The Soviet army is filtering on through the country at a rapid rate. Frontal attacks are avoided everywhere. If a certain point is defined, Soviet troops and agents creep around it. The usual mode of approach to a town is to send a few skillful emissaries forward. These get in touch with the malcontents behind the Polish front, and so distrust and defeatism is spread. The Soviet army is not well organized or well furnished with supplies, but the country through which they are passing is prosperous, and if there is any lack, they can quite well live on the land without drawing on base. The insouciance of the population here is beyond belief. One would imagine the country in no danger and the Bolsheviks a thousand miles away. Weygand is not well supported by the Polish authorities. Their hearts are not much with him. But the imminence of peril may bring them round to give him support. The important fact is that the French officers are gradually getting to the front line and that is a guarantee of success. Warsaw 2nd August, 1920. The situation is less hopeless than it was a week ago, and General Weygand may yet be able to pull the army together. The greatest difficulty is to find capable generals and to secure their appointment when found. The hostility of the different schools to one another, Austrian, Russian, German, added to political animosities, makes the task of getting suitable commanders for the armies one of extreme complication. In the matter of keeping the Danzig route open, great progress has been achieved. General Hacking has rendered valiant service. Apart from the material advantage gained, there is considerable moral gain. The Poles felt that with the Danzig route closed, they could be throttled by their powerful enemy from the east. The importance attached by the Russians to cutting communication between Warsaw and the sea is shown by the energetic advance of the Soviet right along the southern border of East Prussia. If they can capture Thorn and cut the railway between Danzig and Warsaw, they will feel they have the Poles in their grasp. Warsaw, 3rd August, 1920 The Bolsheviks have captured Brest-Litovsk and have crossed the Bug below it. The retreating Polish troops omitted to destroy the bridges and the passage of the river was badly defended. Weygand appears to be less satisfied than he was regarding the attitude of the military leaders. They are unwilling to accept his advice and measures agreed upon are tardily executed. The Anglo-French mission has demanded a meeting with the Cabinet Committee of Defense. We shall make a vigorous protest against the failure to take full advantage of Weygand's recommendations. Some positive agreement regarding future cooperation is indispensable. The general staff applied to me urgently today to expedite the disembarkation of rifles at Danzig. The present stock is exhausted. They express gratitude for the effective action already taken by us. Warsaw, 3rd August, 1920 
made an expedition yesterday along the Ostrov Road to the north of Warsaw. This road is the main artery of communication between the capital and the northeastern frontier. I therefore expected that it would be blocked with troops and munition wagons, also with refugees flying before the Bolsheviks. As a matter of fact, there was very little traffic on it. We met one convoy of wounded, but I saw no troops marching north. In the villages some preparations were being made for defense, but nothing of a very serious character. Curiously enough, most of the people I saw who were engaged in putting up barbed wire and other forms of protection were Jews. This was surprising as the Jews are suspected of being an element friendly to the Bolsheviks. But the feeling here between Christians and Jews is so strong, suspicion is so rife, it is difficult to ascertain the truth about anything. As an indication of the feeling between the Poles and Jews, I may recount the following. Two private soldiers who were on the box of my car shook their fists as they passed Jews putting up wire entanglements, not that they objected to the work that they were doing, but merely as a normal expression of spontaneous antipathy. I have already said that there was very little traffic on the road. In the course of 60 kilometers we passed less than a hundred refugees. Most of these came from Minsk and from other towns in White Russia, very few indeed from localities in Poland proper. Some of them told us that they had been driving their carts for 10 or 14 days in front of the Bolsheviks, keeping about 20 kilometers in advance. Many said that they were going to friends or relatives in the southern parts of Poland. It is probable that some at least were spies or advance agents of the Bolsheviks. They seemed too cheerful for genuine refugees. The Polish peasants I talked to in the villages we passed through seemed to have made up their minds that the Bolsheviks would probably not come on, but that if they did, it was not worthwhile shifting. The population here has seen so many invasions that it has ceased to pay attention to them. The general attitude of everybody is the easy view that the disagreeable will not happen, and if it is fated to happen, there is no remedy. Therefore, the wisest course is to do nothing. It is impossible to obtain correct information here regarding the Bolshevik advance. The general staff only admits the loss of a town 48 hours after it has fallen. The fort of Bresk-Litovsk was captured the other day a few hours after Generals Radcliffe and Cardin de Viart had been there. While they were there, no particular danger was apprehended, as no one knew the Russians were within striking distance. So much has been written in military history of the line of the book that I expected a much more formidable obstacle than this river turned out to be. It has innumerable salients and re-entrance and is fordable in many places. Warsaw, 4th August, 1930 the Polish government is anxious that Jusserand and I should proceed to Paris and London to bring home our governments the extreme urgency of the situation and the necessity of increased military assistance. I telegraphed in this sense, but the Prime Minister is sure to decide that we are to remain in Warsaw until armistice negotiations have been concluded. That may be the Greek Kalends. Warsaw, 4th August, 1920 the Polish delegation which was sent to Baranovich did not find there any Soviet delegation with whom serious discussion was possible. We had a meeting with the War Committee of the Polish Cabinet last night when the ministers decided that they would not send delegates to Minsk until the representatives had returned from Baranovice and until they knew precisely what had occurred. Incidentally, it was stated that the return of the Polish delegates to Warsaw had been impeded by Bolshevik forces at the frontier. It was also alleged that the road to Minsk, where a fresh meeting of delegates has been suggested, was almost impassable. They now regard the possibility of concluding an armistice with the Soviet as quite hopeless. They made a vigorous declaration of their determination to defend Warsaw to the last and to continue fighting even if they lost Warsaw. Warsaw, 4th August, 1920. Later. 
General Cardin de Viart is of opinion that the Bolshevik cavalry may possibly cut the railway communication between Warsaw and Posen and Warsaw and Danzig by Saturday night, the 7th of August, and this view is shared by the French authorities. The general therefore considered that by the 7th, at latest, everything should be evacuated from the legation which cannot be transported by motor car. The Polish government have not yet made up their mind to what town they will transfer the government if Warsaw has to be evacuated. The present idea is to proceed to Częstochowa, but the accommodation there is utterly insufficient and the town is already full of refugees from eastern Galicia. The papal nuncio, as doyen of the diplomatic corps, has summoned a meeting of the heads of the different legations for tomorrow and it is proposed that the principal diplomatic representatives should call on the Minister for Foreign Affairs and insist on a decision as to the place to which the government proposes to move, and as to the date on which the move should be made. The Polish ministers appeared quite blind to the danger of Warsaw being surrounded. Warsaw, 5th August, 1920 we had a great meeting last night between the Franco-British Mission and the Council of National Defense. Sapieha again brought to our notice the suspicious attitude of the Soviet regarding armistice negotiations. He suggested that the Entente is being flouted and that the only fitting action would be a declaration of war by France and England against the Soviet government. It is clear that the Soviet were merely gaining time until their advance on Warsaw had materialized. The meeting then discussed the position of General Weygandt. Jusserand's tone was moderate, but he claimed that all important information, whether good or bad, should be unreservedly communicated to Weygandt. Secondly, that his advice on any military matter once accepted should be translated into action. In reply, the chief of the staff paid a warm tribute to the assistance he had received from Weygand and Radcliffe, declaring that he had been cooperating cordially with them during the last few days. But the Polish army was in a difficult situation. It had only recently come into being. Its organization had been improvised. It was deficient in training and experience. It lacked technical equipment. Moreover, the troops were exhausted after their long retreat. General Rozwadowski concluded by stating that the Polish general staff accepted entire responsibility regarding the preparations, but they would be glad to receive Wagen's advice nevertheless. The attitude of the chief of the staff was so unsatisfactory that he pressed for a clear declaration from the ministers to the effect that all information should be given to Wagen promptly and that subsequently his advice should be followed. General Rozwadowski did not respond to this, repeating again what he had already said regarding the special conditions in Poland, adding that the Polish troops had peculiar qualities, defensive tactics invariably failed while the offensive succeeded, the Polish army must attack. The Minister of Foreign Affairs now intervened in the discussion, regretting that General Weygand should have cause to think that his advice was not followed. As far as he could speak in the absence of the chief of the state, the matter would be put on a new basis. In any case, he begged Weygand not to be discouraged, but to carry on his work. I then asked whether Prince Sapieha's statement might be taken as an official expression of the views of the whole government. The vice president of the council and the minister of defense both replied in the affirmative, but the chief of the staff remained recalcitrant and declared that both he and the chief of the state were convinced of the necessity of the offensive. The discussion continued for some time without any precise result, but the practical outcome will be an improvement in Wagen's position. The meeting then discussed the question of the policy to be followed if it became necessary to evacuate Warsaw. Prince Sapieha said that no decision had yet been taken, but the choice lay between Posen, Częstochowa, and Krakow. As regards Posen, this would be the most suitable from a strategical point of view, as affording easiest communication with Danzig. On the other hand, its former association with Germany may be considered by some as constituting an objection. Częstochowa was bound up with the most cherished traditions of Polish history and the Catholic religion. It was in the heart of a purely Polish territory and with the halo of national sentiment surrounding it would form a good rallying point for the Polish people. 
Though not so well placed as Posen for communication, with Danzig it was yet not too badly located. Krakow was the ancient capital and a fortress, but might easily be severed completely from all communications with the Allies. In conclusion, the vice president of the council requested the Franco-British mission to point out to their respective governments that the Russians were now invading the heart of Poland in a flagrant contempt of all notes presented by the Entente. Warsaw, 5th August, 1920, evening. Jusserand and I have telegraphed home regarding the form which military assistance from France and England might take if the action of the Soviet government in armistice negotiations renders military assistance to Poland necessary. We were unanimous that in no case should less than two divisions be sent, together with two cavalry divisions, and the administrative services necessary to make the force self-supporting, should it prove impracticable to send an expeditionary force we suggest the occupation of Danzig by Franco-British troops. Warsaw, 6th August, 1920. As I anticipated, the home government negative the Polish suggestion that Jusserand and I should proceed to Paris and London. Warsaw, 6th August, 1920, evening. The Soviet army continues to advance rapidly and is now within 30 miles of Warsaw. They have crossed every conceivable frontier ethnographic or otherwise, and are well within Polish territory. The attitude of the Polish government towards armistice negotiations does not justify this aggression. Ever since I have been here, 25th July, there has been a genuine and urgent desire for an armistice, and all possible expedition has been used in negotiating. Postponement of meetings has been entirely due to calculated delay on the Russian side. Warsaw, 7th August, 1920. A Provisional Revolutionary Committee of Poland has been formed at Białystok, which the Soviet forces recently captured. It has distributed the following leaflet. Let us march on Warsaw with a view to saving that which has not been destroyed by the government of the squires. Every lost moment means the death of thousands from hunger. Up, comrades! Fulfill your duty! Let proletarians unite with proletarians against the exploiters! The Polish army is regrouping for the defense of Warsaw and has broken contact in many places with the three advancing Russian columns. This is a deliberate military move and will, it is hoped, procure for the Polish army a breathing space to recover morale. The rapid retirement need not be viewed with undue alarm. Right or wrong, there is a definite strategic plan. While the situation remains critical, Weygand is more hopeful than 48 hours ago. He says that the Poles are beginning to work more closely with him, but he complains of their unbusinesslike habits, of their incredible unpunctuality, and of messengers coming in and out of the room during a conference. Ever since the mission has been here, we have pointed out that the North was left unduly open, was defended by dispirited troops and, that is, the obvious danger to Warsaw. On the south, they had all their best regiments. We therefore urged them to transfer from the south to the north. It is still undoubtful how far they have followed this advice, sound as it appears to be. It would seem probable that they are either acting on secret information or that they have some hidden scheme. The Poles have really quite good strategical position, as they have interior lines with cross-communication by railway, whereas the Bolsheviks spread out with no reserves and very little cross-railway communication. But all this is of no good unless a morale can be revived. The main weakness proceeds from officers in high command. The assistance of French officers at the front is not always welcome. At Ostrowenka on the north, two French officers sent up were badly received by an incompetent general in command, who is stated to have seized their cars and sent them back on foot. If this story is confirmed, the general deserves to be cashiered. The Polish delegates who were appointed to negotiate with the Russians at Baranowice are back in Warsaw. I had a conversation with one of them this morning. He describes the Russian officers as very much of the French Revolution 1793 type. Young, enthusiastic, with flaming eyes and long hair, but completely under civilian commissaries. Most of the commissaries are Jews, but not those who were sent to Baranowice. The Poles esteemed it an act of courtesy that Christians were sent. 
Vagan's view is that so long as the Soviets think they have a chance of taking Warsaw, there is no hope whatsoever of an armistice. He seems to have the impression that the Russian invading force has very small reserves, that the troops are poor, but the officers and superior command good. Private conversations with the Russians at Baranovica gave no indication of what their terms to Poland would be. But they confirmed the view that there are two schools of thought in Russia, headed respectively by Lenin and Trotsky. The object of both is identical, the widest extension of their propaganda. Lenin thinks this can be carried out during peace. Trotsky holds that military prestige is a better advertisement. The Russians spoken to appeared confident in the success of their propaganda, which, they said, was so simple yet so effective that it could only be a question of time for the whole of Europe to succumb. My own view is that the Bolsheviks' military prestige has got to be destroyed and that there will be no change and no peace until this has been done. I visited this afternoon the proposed new front in the direction of Minsk Mazowiecki. A treble entanglement of barbed wire is being put round Warsaw at a radius of about 20 kilometers, and a certain number of trenches have been dug for troops in support. There is a second line of barbed wire closer to the city. The work has all been done in the course of the last fortnight and has been laid out under technical officers, but it did not appear to me to be well designed. The distance from the city is so small that if this second line is broken at any point, nothing could stop the Russians from penetrating to the heart of Warsaw. On the other hand, the small circumference gives a fairly numerous defense per yard, 70 kilometers and 50,000 men, about 700 men per kilometer. The road to the Novominsk was very crowded by refugees, mainly from the Bresk, Litovsk and Biała districts. We met one party of prison wardens from Biała, who frankly admitted that they had left their prisoners to look after themselves and had come away in a party. All prison wardens did the same on the approach of the Bolsheviks. For the first people, the Bolsheviks hanged or tortured were the police and prison wardens. Warsaw, 8th August, 1920. General Dovbor has decided not to accept the southern command. Dovbor has a high reputation as a military commander. He has hitherto been excluded from employment on account of his hostility to Piłsudski. His reception by the head of the state was not particularly cordial, for Piłsudski said, We have never been able to work together, but public opinion demands that I should now offer you a high command. So, I do so. Dovbor, who was at Posen, endeavored to arrange a secret interview with Vagand before arriving there, but Vagand avoided a meeting. There is considerable suspicion that the Posen district has some idea of cutting adrift from Warsaw. The Poznanians consider themselves superior in military ability and in general efficiency to the rest of the Poles, and the truth is that in character they are quite different. The Poznanian regiments are reputed to be the best in the whole army. Nothing is more certain in this part of the world than the immense prestige still enjoyed by Germany and the German army. The war appears hardly to have diminished it. German training is held to be synonymous with efficiency. The high reputation of the Poznanian troops is due to the fact that they are more German than the rest. I have previously recorded the incredible indifference of the public here in the presence of a grave national danger. This has now given place in some sections to alarm. There is a body of opinion which holds that Warsaw ought not to be defended, indeed cannot be defended, and that the Poles should fall back farther west and try to reorganize. Vagand is opposed to this view and holds that if Polish troops will fight, Warsaw ought not to be lost. Warsaw, 9th August, 1920 No two peoples have a stronger instinctive dislike for one another than Germans and Poles. The Poles credit the Germans with astounding military efficiency and infinite political guile. If the Germans had one half the capacity for political intrigue with which the Poles credit them, they would have conquered the world long ago. On the other side, the Germans have quite an undue contempt for Polish ability, while some of them underrate the immense importance of Poland as a barrier against Russian advance. The French are so anti-German that it is difficult to frame any scheme in which they would cooperate to obtain German support against communism. But it is obvious that if Germany goes Soviet, the whole European position is compromised. 
statesmanship has no more important task than to prevent Germany becoming communistic. A strong Poland would be an effective barrier, but national prejudice obscures vision. Warsaw, 9th August, 1920. It is now a week since Hanke left. I cannot say that the position has improved in the interval. The Russian advance has proceeded less rapidly than I anticipated, but the probability of a Polish defeat is undiminished. To a precise and methodical mind, the slackness and want of method here are almost unbearable. Everyone turns up at meetings an hour or two late, and when at last a conference is started, interruptions occur incessantly. Messengers coming in and out on the most trivial matters. Vagant has gained in influence. The government asks him today to take over the duties of chief of the staff. He does not wish to have responsibility without real power. Piłsudski insists on retaining the supreme authority, but appears now less disinclined to utilize Vagan's services than he was ten days ago. Warsaw, 10th August, 1920. The Polish government yesterday offered Vagan the post of chief of the staff with very extended powers. He has telegraphed to Paris for instructions. Warsaw, 10th August, 1920. A vigorous telegram has been received from London to the following effect. The French and British governments make the following declaration to the Polish government. They consider that at forthcoming negotiations at Minsk, Polish government should do its utmost to conclude an armistice and, if necessary, preliminary peace on terms which will secure independence of Poland with its ethnographical frontier. If, however, the Russian Soviet government insist on terms which infringe legitimate independence of Poland and Polish government rejects them, French and British governments will 1. Take all the steps they can to interrupt contact between Russia and the outside world and put pressure on Russia by other means to respect independence of Poland. 2. Supply Polish army with military material for 22 divisions and military advice but they cannot in any circumstance send Allied troops over and above missions already there. 3. Do their utmost to keep open communication between Poland and Allies. On the other hand, provided that Poland 1. Makes a public declaration that it is in its intention to fight to the end for its independence against Soviet attacks. 2. Appoints commander-in-chief who shall have no other functions and will accept effective assistance of Allied officers. 3 will accept and act on military advice tendered by allies. Maintain Polish army at strength of 22 divisions, completed as far as possible to their normal effectives. Defend at all costs line of the Vistula in case the line held at this moment by Polish armies cannot be maintained. This communication from the West was cordially received by Polish ministers. The only point on which they find any difficulty is that respecting the army command. Wagen's view is that the Bolsheviks evidently intend to make their assault on Warsaw on 12th or 13th August, so that any change in the supreme command at this moment might be dangerous. Moreover, Wagen's appointment as chief of staff, which is contemplated and only awaits authority from Paris, would achieve a similar result in less violent form. Warsaw, 11th August, 1920. A disagreeable surprise occurred today. The news came from London that Kamenev had handed in the British government the terms to be offered to the Polish government at Minsk tomorrow. These are the terms. 1. Strength of Polish army shall be reduced to one annual contingent, up to 50,000 men, and command and administration of army to aggregate 10,000 men. 2. Demobilization shall take place within one month. All arms over and above such as may be required for needs of army, as reduced above as well as of civic militia, shall be handed over to Soviet Russia and Ukraine. 4. All war industries shall be demobilized. 5. No troops or war material shall be allowed to come from abroad. Line Volkovsk Bielostok Krajevo shall be fully at disposal of Russia for commercial transit from and to Baltic. 7. Dependents of all Polish citizens killed and wounded or incapacitated in the war shall be given lands free. On the other hand, group omitted, with demobilization, Russian and Ukrainian troops shall withdraw from Polish front. 2. Upon termination of these operations, number of Russian, 
frontline troops shall be considerably reduced and fixed at a figure to be agreed on. 3. Armistice line shall be status quo but no further east than one indicated in note of Lord Curzon of 20th July. Polish army shall withdraw to a distance of 5 wiorsts from that line, zone between the two lines being neutral. Final frontier of independent state of Poland shall in main be identical with line indicated in note of Lord Curzon of 20th July, but additional territory shall be given to Poland on the east in region of Bielostok Kolm. These terms were so extravagant that I cannot conceive any Polish government taking them into consideration. I should have expected London to have refused them without further parley. Several passages in the telegram were indecipherable, so that no full communication of the text could be made to the Poles. The view we all take here is that to accept terms of this nature would amount to disastrous capitulation. Rumbold keeps a cool head under these difficult circumstances and must have a disagreeable task in making his communication to the Polish government. He has fortunately an excellent personal position here and is regarded by the Poles as a sincere friend to their country. It may be that the net result of the episode will not be unfavorable, for the proposed armistice terms are so humiliating that they are in themselves sufficient to prove that safety is only to be found in fighting to the last. They slam the door on compromise and negotiation. Warsaw, 11th August, 1920. I have just written to Hanke on the importance of obtaining German cooperation against the Soviet. News from Paris is to the effect that the German diplomatic representatives there are constantly fishing for an invitation from the Entente to use German military force against the Soviet. It was quite certain that the French government and Mr. Milgeron would decline any such overture. But I am not sure that a blunt negative is wise or requisite. If a good bargain could be made with the Germans, I should vote for it. But I am skeptical about the truth of the information. The really important point is that the whole of Central Europe should combine to resist Bolshevism and that no country should be in open or veiled cooperation with Moscow. It is commonly believed in the West that the Soviet military power is much more considerable than it is really and that no military success against them is attainable. This I believe to be a false estimate. I go further and hold that a crushing defeat of the Bolshevik army is not only the most desirable event which could happen, but is an indispensable condition to any real peace with the Bolsheviks. If without inflicting a military defeat, we patch up some kind of trade agreement with Moscow, the value of any engagements taken by them will be nil. No agreement will be worth the paper on which it is written. A striking military success is an indispensable preliminary to serious negotiation. Unless their military prestige is shattered, their propaganda will undermine the position in many countries of Central Europe. Warsaw, 12th August, 1920. The telegram from London yesterday which transmitted the terms on which the Bolsheviks were ready to conclude peace fell like a bombshell here. Previous news, both from London and Paris, had convinced the Poles that they would obtain full support from the West unless reasonable terms were offered with genuine security for execution. No one thought, then, that the Bolsheviks would have the audacity to propose the disbandment of the Polish army or its reduction to an insignificant figure. There is, of course, not the smallest chance that such terms will be accepted. They will not even be discussed. Personally, I cannot blame the Polish government for refusing to treat on such a basis, nor do I criticize the conclusion which they drew, namely, that any negotiation with Moscow before the coming battle is mere trifling and can by no possibility lead to serious result. Meantime, the fact that any such basis has been thought possible in London has not improved the position or authority of the British section of the Anglo-French mission. Warsaw, 12th August, 1920 After communicating his incredible armistice terms to the English government, Kamenev appears to have complained that the representatives of the Russian command had waited in vain for the Polish armistice delegates ever since the evening of 9th August. This is adding misstatement to insult. Meanwhile, Moscow refuses to take in Polish wireless. Warsaw, 13th August, 1920. The following is the military position. The Polish troops are centered on a line 20 kilometers north of Warsaw. The battle has just begun. Weygand considers that the Polish force is sufficient to withstand the enemy's attack, provided the leaders keep their heads and the troops do their duty. 
Other authorities are less confident. The diplomatic position is as follows. The Polish government is genuinely anxious for peace, but they will not agree to any disarmament which leaves them helpless before the Bolsheviks, nor would they accept Bolshevik dictation as to internal affairs. They are violently opposed to any delivery of arms to the Soviet. Warsaw, 13th August, 1920. I have just returned from the front line near Radzimin, about 12 miles north of Warsaw. The Bolshevik attack has not yet developed fully, but while I was there, a fairly heavy artillery fire was being maintained on both sides. The battery I was with was firing at 5,000 and 6,000 meters. This morning, a few Bolshevik cavalry created a panic, and a whole Polish battalion was only rallied by a threat that runaways would be shot. A young French officer who had been at the front all day said the Bolsheviks were weak enough, but he doubted the Poles standing at all. If they would fight, they could win. On the way back, I came across some Bolshevik prisoners who had just been taken. They were mild, downtrodden peasants without enthusiasm, fanaticism, or conviction. They had good boots, no uniforms, and looked fairly well fed. They said, however, that until they got into Poland, their fare had been very scanty. Jewish commissaries did everything in their division, commandeered food, gave orders, explained objectives. When the soldier asked about peace, the commissar told them Poland had asked for peace, but in conjunction with England. Bolsheviks will have nothing to do with England. The soldiers do not talk of their army as we, but of the Bolshevik army, as if they had nothing in common with it but force service. These men came from the Ukraine and had served under Danikin and had been taken prisoner by the Bolsheviks and made to serve. They said the Bolshevik army was bad and was short on ammunition. But the Danikin army had been worse, the officers doing nothing but drink and play cards. The general impression they gave was that of good-natured serfs who were just driven forward by commissaires and Chinese. Their only desire was to get home. This applies to nine-tenths of the prisoners I have seen. The other tenth appear fanatical devils. On getting back to the Legion at Warsaw, 13th August, 7 p.m., I found that all preparations had been made for leaving Warsaw at 11 p.m. by special train, including two carriages for the diplomatic corps. This decision had been arrived at on the strong advice of General Henri and General Biot after receipt of news from the front brought by officers of the French military mission. Their opinion was that the Polish troops were resisting badly and that there was a considerable probability of precipitate fight. An intercepted radio indicated that the Bolshevik general attack was to take place at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. General Henri had ordered the headquarters staff of the French mission, with the exception of a few leading officers who had special cars, to retire to Łódź. The Polish Minister for Foreign Affairs had written that the government could not assume responsibility for the safety of the diplomatic corps after tonight. Hurried arrangements were therefore made to clear out what is still left of the diplomatic and consular bodies, with the exception of the Italians, who have been specially instructed not to leave until after the Polish government itself left. The papal nuncio, who, conjointly with Sir Horace Rumboldt, had negotiated the arrangements for the evacuation of the diplomatic corps, will also remain. After a night of considerable confusion and bustle, the train eventually got away from Warsaw Goods, station about 2 a.m. At the last minute, one of the coaches intended for the diplomatic corps broke down. Very slow progress was made during the night owing to constant blocks on the line, but we reached Wuch at about 9 a.m. next morning. General Vagand, General Radcliffe and Sir Percy Lorraine, counselor of the British legation, decided to remain in Warsaw and see how events developed. They were instructed to avoid all undue risk of capture and to take special precautions to keep the motor cars in which they were provided under reliable supervision and plentifully provided with tires and inner tubes. There is singularly little alarm among the mass of the population. The upper classes have already left the town, in many cases having placed their pictures and other valuables in charge of the museum authorities. Warsaw has been so often occupied by foreign troops that the event in itself causes neither the excitement nor alarm which would be produced in a less experienced city. Even the fact that the invaders are Bolsheviks with no sympathy for white Poles, as they call the squirearchy of this country, fails to cause the terror which would be felt elsewhere in such circumstances. Meanwhile, Piłsudski had left Warsaw 24 hours earlier. 
namely on the evening of 12th August. In accordance with the Polish plan of 6th August, he proceeded by a motor car up the left bank of the Vistula in order to put himself at the head of the five and a half divisions. This force was composed of elements which could ill be spared from the defense of Warsaw and Lwów. The scheme agreed upon between Piłsudski and the other military authorities on 6th August provided that the flank attack should not commence until 17th August. There was thus a dangerous interval of at least three days between the date of the Grand Russian assault on Warsaw and the commencement of Piłsudski's flank attack to effect a diversion for the relief of the capital. The calculation made was that the strength of the artillery massed in Warsaw would be sufficient to enable the Polish forces to hold out, but Piłsudski himself was apprehensive and other military authorities shared his apprehension. Troops defending a large town like Warsaw are liable to be infected by the panic of civilian inhabitants, and panic was not unlikely to occur. Piłsudski's proceedings from the time he arrived on the Wiebsch until 17th or 18th August are of such interest that I give a translation of several passages from his own account. Piłsudski's story not only gives a clear description of the strategic combination which he had devised, but incidentally reveals his characteristics in a manner not obtainable except from a personal narrative. Supreme Crisis and Flank Attack, 13th to 20th August The Supreme Crisis I have now brought the narrative of events in Warsaw up to the eve of the Supreme Crisis. It will be seen that the Russian commander had not concentrated his full strength against the town of Warsaw. On the contrary, he had dissipated his force in three directions. First, in detaching a considerable section to advance along the Prussian border and take Thorn. Secondly, by detaching a still larger body to pass by the Warsaw front in a westerly direction, with a view to crossing the Vistula below Warsaw, subsequently attacking Warsaw from the west and south. Thirdly, he had allowed the force on his extreme left to devote its attention to the capture of Lwów, instead of protecting the left wing of his main attack on Warsaw. The explanation of these errors was the conviction that the Polish forces were thoroughly demoralized and incapable of serious resistance. In the history of the previous month, there was much to justify this view. There can be little doubt that Tokaczewski believed that he could take Warsaw when he chose, and that he preferred to delay the capture until the force he had detached to the right had crossed the Vistula, and thus cut off the Polish retreat. The precise authorship of the Polish plan of defense is not known, but statements made both by Wegen and Piłsudski point to the conclusion that the boldest measures included in the scheme were due to the personal initiative of Piłsudski. His plan was briefly as follows, to concentrate a striking force of five and a half divisions on the river Wiepsz. In order to achieve this, he withdrew units from both the army defending Warsaw as well as from the force defending Lwów those taken from the southern army being picked troops. The scheme provided that these five and a half divisions should assemble by 13th August behind the Wiebsch in the vicinity of Demblin and should be so organized as to be capable of extreme mobility. The idea was to allow the Russians to attack Warsaw and become thoroughly engaged with the Polish troops defending the town. 
Although these Polish troops had been weakened, they were thought capable of maintaining an adequate defense for three days, after which a flank attack from Demblin would materialize and afford relief to Warsaw by disturbing the enemy's communications. The Polish arrangements were carried out accordingly to the plan. Piłsudski left Warsaw on the evening of 12th August and put himself at the head of the mobile attacking force. Two surprises awaited him on arrival. The 21st Corps had retired the day before, giving up a strong position at Kotsk without justification. The troops, with some exceptions, were badly equipped, having in many cases no boots, while the reinforcements sent to increase the numbers had been so distributed that men armed with French rifles were allotted to battalions armed with Mausers, and vice versa. Two days were spent in putting matters right, as far as time allowed. While the equipment was poor and there were many defects of organization, Piłsudski was gratified to find that the spirit of the men was much better than he had anticipated after so long and so a painful retreat. Meantime, on August 14, the Bolshevik attack on Warsaw had commenced. The first day's fighting was by no means reassuring. Certain battalions were reported to have behaved badly and the suburb of Radzimin in the immediate vicinity of Warsaw was lost retaken and lost again. On the evening of the 14th, Piłsudski received alarming telegrams from Warsaw, painting the situation in most gloomy colors, and urging him to afford assistance, either by bringing back his troops or by anticipating the date originally fixed for his flank attack. Piłsudski decided to adhere as far as possible to his original plan, merely advancing the date by 24 hours. The bad news confirmed him in the urgency of striking, striking hard, but he did not otherwise modify his plan. He reiterated the orders to his attacking force, urging upon them the necessity of a rapid advance, each division to move independently of that on its right or left, and on no account to wait to preserve alignment. There can be no doubt that the Polish strategy involved a grave risk to Warsaw. The attack on the capital by the Russian force might well lead to the loss of Warsaw before the Polish flank attack had time to dislocate the Russian organization. It appears from the account subsequently given by Tukhachevsky of the movements of the Russian army that the new scheme of diverting forces from the direct attack on Warsaw to an encircling movement across the lower Vistula had upset the original Russian plan to a much greater extent than Piłsudski suspected. In his account of the battle, the latter says, how my mind would have been relieved if I could have supposed with any degree of probability that it was not Tukhachevsky's object to attack Warsaw with all his force. If I had known of the division of his strength into two fractions, and the mission assigned to two of his armies not to attack Warsaw directly, but to execute a long march and endeavor to force the passage of the great river Vistula, I should have been delivered from half my anxiety. I should not have been obliged to torture my mind on the subject of the nonsense fundamental, which I had taken as a basis for my decisions. Being in ignorance of the Russian mistake, Piłsudski suffered acute anxiety from 6th to 12th August, waiting for the concentration of his own forces south of the Vieprz. He declares that while he noticed considerable movement of Russian troops to the west of Warsaw, he could not suspect a diversion as important as that which was carried out. The condition of affairs at Warsaw on 12th August before Piłsudski left is thus described by him. In taking leave of General Sosnkowski, I drew his attention to the disorder which prevailed, both in the command of the troops and in their organization, and I requested him to do his utmost to eliminate the groupings, groups, subgroups, supergroups, advance groups and rear groups, which, notwithstanding my efforts, existed in such numbers that there were leaders and staffs without troops, and on certain points a hundred soldiers were divided into three groups, each commanded by a general. I further urged him to be a tutelary guide for generals, who were perpetually disputing with one another, and to put an end to the anarchy of command which I feared. The Flank Attack The original date fixed for the flank attack was 17th August. But in view of the alarming news from Warsaw, Piłsudski decided to commence the advance on the 16th at dawn. Stringent orders were issued to advance with such speed that the troops would reach the main road from Brzesz to Warsaw on the second day. On the 16th and 17th, the Polish force under Piłsudski covered an immense distance. 
It is claimed by Polish authorities that with no other troops would so rapid and long a march have been possible. The enemy were taken completely by surprise. It was not until the 18th, in the early morning, that Piłsudski's troops came up against serious opposition. How was it that Tukhachevsky had left his lines of communication so unprotected? There were three reasons. He had relied upon Budionny's cavalry to keep the Polish right fully occupied. He had thought the Poles so dispirited as to be incapable of effecting any surprise. And thirdly, he had come up against such severe fighting in other parts of the field that he had been forced to withdraw the necessary troops from his lines of communication. During the days between 12th and 18th August, heavy fighting had been carried on in two sectors of the battle area. North of Warsaw and in the immediate vicinity of the city, repeated attacks by Russian forces had alternately succeeded and failed. The suburbs of Warsaw had been taken and retaken by the opposing sides. The Polish defense, mainly through superior concentration of artillery, having barely succeeded in keeping the attack at bay. The Russian commander realized too late the fatal dispersion of his forces and sent message after message to his outlying troops, both in the north and the south, to concentrate on the critical point. It was in vain. Both Budionne and the commander in the north persisted in pursuing their own objectives. Tukhachevsky was only able to obtain reinforcements from the troops guarding his lines of communication. And these reinforcements he paid for by leaving his communications open to Polish attack. He had not sufficiently appreciated the Polish capacity for recuperation in a grave national crisis. The second area where fighting had been continuous during these days was the district west and north of Warsaw in the vicinity of Modlin. Here, the troops, under the energetic leadership of General Sikorsky, had not only prevented the Russian forces from crossing the Vistula, but had driven them back to the line of the Narev and Vkra. In this sector also, the Russian commander experienced an unpleasant surprise. He had anticipated that the Polish army would be concentrated around Warsaw and that his advance to the west of the city in an encircling movement would encounter only scattered bodies of demoralized troops. Here again, he had counted without the energy and military skill of his Polish opponent. Both sides had taken heavy risks. Time was the decisive factor. If Warsaw fell before Piłsudski's attack developed, his strategy would achieve no decisive purpose. On the other hand, if Warsaw could hold out until Piłsudski reached the Russian lines of communication, there was the possibility that the whole Russian advance would be demoralized. Piłsudski was the first to realize the surprising success of his maneuver, and on the morning of 18th August, in spite of warnings from his subordinate officers, who believed the road back to Warsaw would be infested with marauding Cossacks, he decided to return at full speed to the capital in order to organize an aggressive pursuit of the Soviet army. On arrival in Warsaw, he found the general tone depressed. There was more anxiety than elation. Warsaw had not realized the success of the flank attack from the Vieprz. What was present to their minds was the anxious struggle of the last five days, during which at any moment it appeared possible that the Russians would enter Warsaw. There was also acute anxiety on account of the position on the lower Vistula and the renewed attacks on Płock and Wodzławek. The officers with whom Piłsudski deliberated were skeptical about so rapid a success. The habit of defeat involved by the long retreat from Biała had affected men's minds. They could not realize the complete transformation of the position. Piłsudski insisted that if full advantage was taken of the situation, and that if pursuit was vigorously pushed, the enemy could scarcely escape disaster. While this view was not shared, Piłsudski's orders for an energetic pursuit of the Soviet army had to be obeyed. Having briefly surveyed in the foregoing pages the main incidents of the flank attack, I return to a diary of events, as seen from Posen and later from Warsaw. From
Diary from 15th August to 1st of September. Posen, 15th August, 1920. The atmosphere in this province is excellent. There can be little doubt that Posen is the proper base on which to reform if Warsaw falls. Large meetings were held here yesterday, attended by thousands, in order to express the thanks of the inhabitants of Posen for French and English assistance. The delegates appointed by these meetings were received by Jusserand and myself. They expressed the unanimous resolution of the province to fight to the end for Polish independence. The objects for which the Great War was waged were analogous to those for which they were fighting now. Anarchy was not less incompatible with liberty and progress than military despotism. 15th August, 1920. Later. Against the favorable impression formed here must be set disquieting news from Warsaw about the fighting on the 14th. Warsaw has implored Piłsudski to attack at once, on the flank, in order to relieve pressure. Posen, 16th August, 1920. The first line of defense round Warsaw was taken by the Russians on the 14th, but has now been recaptured. Everything depends on the Polish counteroffensive on the Wiepsz. This starts today. It is a gambler's throw. A bold stroke in the unorthodox Piłsudski manner may disconcert the whole Russian plan and break up the attack. Posen, 17th August, 1920. The bold stroke has succeeded beyond expectation. A complete Bolshevik rout appears possible. Our flank attack from the southeast so surprised the enemy that he put up a very weak resistance. Piłsudski's column has now reached the line, Kolbil Radzin Vodava. To the west of Warsaw also, where the Polish forces were thought to be demoralized, they have had considerable success. Moreover, it is expected that the province of Posen will soon be able to send into the field a large force of trained troops. Posen, 18th August, 1920. Success follows success. The victorious advance of Piłsudski's column continues. The Bolshevik force now attacking Warsaw is in grave peril of capture or destruction. Our forces have reached Luków, the enemy retreating after a slight resistance in the region of Biała and Mienzyżyc. As the moral or immoral force animating Bolshevik troop proceeds largely from commissaires who drive their men forward from the rear, this army is particularly sensitive to any attack from behind. Posen, 19th August, 1920. I have telegraphed to London as follows. Polish counteroffensive against left flank of Russian army has completely reversed position. The enemy, who had advanced to the gates of Warsaw, has been thrown back in disorder behind the Narev and the Buk. The Poles have captured many thousands of prisoners. The English papers continue to harbor the delusion that the Poles are not willing to make peace except upon extravagant terms. This is quite untrue. Even after the astonishing victory of the last few days, Poland is not unreasonable and desires above everything a durable peace safeguarding her independence and giving security. All my conversations with Prince Sapiecha confirm the view that the Polish authorities will be moderate and sensible as to terms of peace. They are tired of war, and I do not find any of the light-headed aggressiveness which is supposed to be incurable in the Polish national character. Warsaw, 19th August, 1920 Return to Warsaw from Posen on receipt of telegram from Wegand. Arrived 10 a.m. and had conference at once with Wegand and Radcliffe. The military situation continues to develop brilliantly. Prisoners taken up to date are variously estimated at from 6,000 to 10,000 and the Russians are retiring in disorder. It cannot yet be called a rout, but it may become one in the course of the next three or four days. Radcliffe says that the Poles do not really follow with sufficient vigor to take full advantage of their success. Wegand complains bitterly of the surly attitude of Marshal Piłsudski. Last night, at a council of war, Piłsudski hardly said a word to him, but discussed for two and a half hours in Polish and paid no attention whatever to his presence. He was anxious to throw up his work at once, but we pointed out that this was out of the question until the battle was over. He still maintained, however, that he desired to return to France directly after the Battle of Warsaw was finished. 
The Poles listened to advice very unwillingly and told him what suited them and were not grateful for assistance. He had got them out of their present mess and now wanted to clear off as soon as he could. Ratcliffe rather concurred. The second point on which Weygand wished to speak was that he had had a long conversation with Prince Sapieha, who had expressed great anxiety about peace negotiations after a possible complete victory by Poland. Prince Sapieha appeared to fear that the French, having recognized Wrangel, would want Poland to go on fighting in order to achieve the discomfiture of the Bolsheviks. Poland, on the other hand, was anxious for peace, was weary of war. Prince Sapieha felt that while England wanted peace, France wanted the downfall of the Soviets, and he anticipated divergence in the advice given by the two powers. His suggestion was that he should proceed to France or England as soon as possible with the Anglo-French mission and that a conference should be held in Paris or London to settle what line should be taken regarding peace negotiations. Later in the afternoon I saw Prince Sapieha with Jusserand. Jusserand told him that his apprehension regarding France was entirely unjustified. Nothing in his instructions at all bore out the view that France would wish Poland to go on fighting in order to assist General Wrangel. On the contrary, France was most anxious for a reasonable and safe peace. Prince Sapieha appeared much relieved. He then gave us considerable details of the instructions given to the Polish delegates at Minsk. But the whole situation regarding this negotiation is so profoundly modified by recent military events that the instructions of Saturday are now no longer relevant. The general impression he left on my mind was, however, that Poland would be reasonable provided that there was no interference with the internal affairs of the country and no question of disarmament. Poland was violently opposed to the latter before the Battle of Warsaw. Much more so now. If, as appears probable, the battle ends in complete rout of the Bolsheviks, the entire position is fundamentally modified. The stricken field starts a new period. Warsaw, 20th August, 1920 Vagant is resolute about the desirability of an early departure from Poland, and he is supported by Jusserand. If the French mission leaves, it is clearly expedient that we of the British mission should take an identical course. The position here has been altogether transformed since our arrival. A great disaster has been averted. Morale is now restored and the Bolsheviks are retreating in disorder. As regards the peace negotiations, these must necessarily enter a new phase, and a clear break from any previous negotiations will increase the chance of an enduring settlement. During the last week, the position of the two countries has been fundamentally altered. As regards Minsk as a place for negotiation, nothing could be more inconvenient and unsuitable. It is inaccessible by telegraph or radio. Messages never seem to get through, and messengers are stopped by broken bridges if they are not shot by frontier guards. The Polish pursuit of the Bolsheviks continues vigorously, the distance covered by Polish units being extraordinary. The total number of prisoners up to date is 15,000, not including large numbers of Bolshevik troops who have abandoned their units and are wandering about the forests. The Russian high command has sent stringent injunctions to Budyonny to bring help to the north, but in spite of these orders, including one signed by Trotsky, Budyonny still remains with the three cavalry divisions round Lemberg. Warsaw, 21st August, 1920. I have written to Sir Henry Wilson, chief of the general staff at the war office, congratulating him on his foresight in having advocated the dispatch of the Anglo-French mission. What was then considered a forlorn hope has developed into a great military success. My anticipation that the victory will be complete is based partly upon the fact the Russian troops, who were sent forward to cross the lower Vistula, have, in order to get back to Russia, to go through or over three difficult fences. A. Sikorsky's column. B. The column now advancing north from Ostrov. C. Piłsudski's divisions, who will soon hold the line Brest-Litovsk to Białystok. To avoid surrender to the Poles, I anticipate that a large number of Russian troops will endeavor to escape into East Prussia and will there be disarmed. There has been a very pretty quarrel between Budyonny in the south and the Moscow authorities. They telegraphed him to come north in a dire emergency in order to save the situation. He replied that he was within 15 kilometers of Lemberg and that he would take Lemberg first, thereupon violent telegrams from Trotsky. 
the result will be that he will fail to assist the North and will also miss Lemberg. Wegen has undoubtedly been of the utmost assistance to the Polish government. They continue to treat him rather badly, often discussing military questions in Polish in his presence, without any explanation or request for his opinion. However, notwithstanding this, Wegen appears to have established a kind of liaison with all the different divisions by means of his French officers, whose work is much appreciated by some commanders, if rather resented by others. Warsaw, 21st August, 1920. Piłsudski's view of the situation is justified. The flank attack from the Wiepsz has completely disorganized the Russian forces. Tukhachevsky believed the Polish army incapable of serious resistance, but they have proved themselves competent to carry out a bold strategic move with intense energy. The 5th Army under Sikorsky has taken a vigorous part in the struggle. Already, since 13th August, they had been heavily engaged with the right center of the Russian forces and had obtained some notable success. It is due to their fighting power under energetic leadership that the Russian plan for crossing the river Vistula was frustrated. Time was thus gained for Piłsudski's flank attack to materialize. In General Sikorsky's account of the operations of the 5th Army, as much importance is attached by him to the fighting on the west of Warsaw as to the flank attack directed by the commander-in-chief. This is an overestimate, but the action of the 5th Army was a notable, indeed an indispensable element in the great Polish success. Strategically, the subsequent pursuit of the disorganized Russian army by Polish forces has no special interest. While a large number of Russian units had been driven over the German frontier and were there disarmed, of 21 divisions advancing on 12th August to attack Warsaw and the surrendering country, seven had been captured, six had been broken up, and the remainder were retreating in dire disorder. By 18th October, an armistice had been concluded between Russia and Poland, based upon a Polish frontier very different from the one demanded by the Russians before the Battle of Warsaw. In March 1921, a treaty of peace was signed between the two countries, since their relations have been of a normal character. There is no longer any talk of the disarmament of Poland, nor of a reduction of the army to a low figure. Still less is there any question of establishing Soviet institutions in Poland. My impressions during the last days in Warsaw are recorded below. Warsaw, 22nd August, 1920 It looks as though the Poles may capture, destroy or drive the whole Russian force over the German frontier. I have just written to Curzon in this sense and have added what I feel strongly, namely my admiration for Polish moderation in the light of so great a success. I have urged him to break off negotiations at Minsk and start again on a new basis, more in harmony with recent events. In dealing with the Soviet, it is wise to be short, sharp and precise. They are clever negotiators, having at their disposal a vast amount of promises which they have no intention of keeping if they find it inconvenient. Experience of negotiations with them in July and August makes me extremely skeptical of any good result except from a convention on the clearest and simplest lines. Warsaw, 22nd August, 1920 Polish peasants in the territory recently captured by Soviet troops are indignant because, despite promises and in conflict with an order, the Soviet commissaires took everything without payment. Apart from this, the discipline of the Soviet troops in the territory occupied is stated to have been good previous to the defeat. Many captured Soviet officers assert that they served merely because it was their only way to keep from starving. Warsaw, 23rd August, 1920 Reports from the front say that very few commissaires or Chinese have been captured. The former have a strong propensity to escape into Germany, the latter commit suicide. While the commissaires are disposed to seek refuge in German territory, there is a marked reluctance among the Russian rank and file to follow them. They prefer to surrender in Poland. The latest estimate of captures is as follows. 60,000 prisoners, 200 guns and 1,000 machine guns. Not much ammunition has been taken, but large quantities of paper money, which has, of course, a very uncertain value. The Polish government is becoming seriously embarrassed by the task of feeding so many prisoners. I have made a special point of seeing how prisoners are treated. So far as I can ascertain the conditions are satisfactory. There is no rancor. Prisoners are regarded as victims rather than hated enemies. 
Those I have seen are healthy and well-fed. Most of them seem glad to be out of the fighting line. Warsaw, 23rd August, 1920. In some quarters, there is a strong disposition to attribute the failure of the armistice negotiations before the Battle of Warsaw to bad faith on the part of the Poles or to exaggerated demands by them, so that it is worthwhile to examine what actually took place in July and August last. On six separate occasions during the last two months, the Soviet government has laid itself open to the charge of deliberately causing delay in the negotiations for an armistice, and on two occasions it has replied by a direct negative to proposals made by the English government, which would have resulted in an immediate suspension of hostilities. The first instance of delay was between 11th and 18th July. Lloyd George, on 11th July, proposed an immediate armistice and requested a definite reply within a week. The Soviet government only replied at the extreme limit of time and then in a negative sense. On 22nd July, Poland sent a wireless message to Moscow proposing a meeting for the discussion of an armistice and asking for a reply by 25th July at latest. The Soviet government deliberately delayed the meeting until July 30th under the pretext that that date had been proposed by the Polish military commander. The Polish government state that no such proposal was made, the obvious interest both of Polish diplomats and Polish generals being to conclude an armistice as rapidly as possible in order to prevent a further advance of the Soviet army. The third occasion was between 30th July and 4th August. Directly, the Polish delegates arrived at Baranowice. The Soviet representatives insisted that the Poles must have a mandate to make peace as well as to make an armistice. There had been no previous mention of this additional power, and Chichirin's statement as to what powers were or were not usual on such occasions is so confused that it does not suggest sincerity. The fourth occasion was between 4th and 9th August. The Soviet representatives proposed that a meeting should take place at Minsk two days after the meeting at Baranowice, although at the same time they demanded that the Polish delegates should obtain new powers, which could not by any possibility be obtained until long after the 4th August, owing to difficulties of travel and communication. The fifth occasion was between 5th and 10th, 11th August. Prince Sapiecha. Polish Minister for Foreign Affairs, having agreed to the proposed meeting at Minsk, Moscow refused, on five separate occasions, to receive the radio message concerning the meeting, switching off whatever Warsaw attempted to get through. Lloyd George, on 6th August, asked Moscow for a 10 days truce, and although the English government offered quite unusual facilities to the Soviet officers for control of the military situation during this time, Moscow refused to accept it. The sixth occasion was on 11th August, when the Soviet government sent a negotiator to the Polish front, pretending that they had previously sent a radio message to the Polish government, fixing the date and hour of appointment. No such radio message was received in Warsaw, and there is no indication of any attempt to send such a message. During the whole of this period, from 11th July to 13th August, the Soviet army was pushing on. An intercepted radio message is of interest in connection with the above. It was sent from one Russian army commander to another on 26th July and said, We have arranged not to inform Poles of our armistice conditions before 4th August. You have therefore four additional days to continue fighting. The two occasions on which Moscow has deliberately refused, without adequate reason, fair proposals from the English government for peace, were when on 18th July, Chichirin declined the proposed peace conference in London and said that the Soviet government would make its own terms with Poland. And when on 6th August, Lloyd George, after a five hours meeting with Krasin and Kamenev, asked for a 10 days truce. During the two months mentioned above, the Soviet armies advanced 300 kilometers towards Warsaw. The Polish army was not in a position to offer serious resistance. It was not less clearly the military interest of Moscow to delay negotiations than it was the interest of Warsaw to advance them and to come to some arrangement which would prevent the invasion of ethnographic Poland and the capture of Warsaw. The Soviet endeavored to draw the maximum advantage from what they believed to be their military superiority. They did this with so thin a veneer of pacific intention that no one but a friend with a telescope to his blind eye could have been deceived by it.
The whole Middle East was amazed at the apparent simplicity of large sections of public opinion in Western Europe and their incomprehensible blindness to quite obvious facts. So far as blame is concerned, this appears to attach solely to those friends of the Soviet who were foolish enough to claim for them the quality of being sincere and straightforward advocates of universal peace on the basis of non-interference and non-propaganda, and of respect for the rights, convictions, and independence of others. This character, the Soviet leaders themselves would be the last to claim. Indeed, they would deny it with the utmost indignation as implying that they had been faithless to the sacred duty of converting the whole world to their doctrines. This process of universal conversion they pursue and prosecute and are compelled by their fundamental tenets to pursue and prosecute by whatever means appear at the moment most efficacious, quite independently of any understanding, pledge, agreement or contract. Warsaw, 24th August, 1920. Prisoners taken from the 16th Soviet Division say that the Bolshevik debacle is complete. They had endeavored to rally at the Niemen River, but this proved impossible owing to the loss of morale. They will have to retire to the Smorgan Baranovich line. Warsaw, 25th August, 1920. A strong telegram has come in from Lloyd George at Lucerne after his interview with Giolitti. The subject is the maintenance of free communication through the port of Danzig. He states that the object of the Treaty of Versailles in this regard was to secure Poland without any restriction the free use and service of the port for Polish imports and exports. The High Commissioner is instructed to do everything possible to secure this. If the Danzig dockers refuse to unload the ships, any available labor is to be employed under the protection of the Allied powers. British and French men of war and Allied military forces at Danzig will render all support and, if necessary, the Allied contingents will be reinforced. The English Admiralty has been instructed to secure the presence of a suitable naval force at Danzig. Warsaw, 25th August, 1920 Percy Lorraine has been to visit the Soviet prisoners and has obtained an interesting picture of conditions in the Soviet army. The prisoners interviewed were of various origin and belonged to different units, so that a general view can be formed. They were a former warrant officer in the Imperial Russian Army who has been serving as a quartermaster sergeant, a cadet officer in an infantry regiment of the Imperial Army a non-commissioned officer formerly belonging to an infantry bridge of the Imperial Army and now serving as a telephonist, a former railway conductor in the Imperial Russian Railways, a former NCO in the Imperial Army, now a private in the Bolshevik ASC, a private in the Imperial Army now serving as a non-commissioned officer, a civilian who hated Bolshevism and who had unsuccessfully attempted desertion on various occasions. A quartermaster sergeant, well-educated and intelligent, who loathed Bolshevism. One of the most surprising results of the interviews with the prisoners mentioned was the entire lack of enthusiasm or conviction regarding the Soviet government. Although there was evidently a genuine universal respect for Lenin, who was esteemed the working man's friend, in contrast to the feeling about Trotsky, who was generally detested and feared. It is a curious fact also that all men who were questioned out of earshot of the others were unanimously agreed that even if peace came, the Soviet government was too strong to be upset at all events for a long time yet. Those bellicose section under Trotsky have a strong hold and now contend that the regime can live only by war. So long as there is war, the driving force is exerted by the commissaires, backed by the Chinese units which are placed at their disposal, and by the terror which the Cheka and its network of spies and denunciators inspire. It was apparent that this dread institution was greatly feared by all prisoners, who at once lowered their voices when being questioned regarding it. The simpler ones could hardly believe that such an organization did not exist in Poland. The general impression gained from the interviews was that Trotsky had rendered such services and gained so strong a position that Lenin will be unable to get rid of him. 
There have been many tentative revolts, but the spy system renders cooperation impossible. And it has not been difficult, therefore, to suppress isolated attempts. In one regiment, 50 men were shot for refusing to go to the Polish front. It was alleged that industrial workmen are now hostile to the Soviet government. There was a strike in the Putilov works at Petrograd in April for better food. It was ruthlessly suppressed. The general impression conveyed was that the Jews and Jewish commissaries were universally detested and the latter particularly feared. On the way out of the camp where Lorraine's motor car got stuck in a sand road, a mixed party of Poles and Bolshevik prisoners came running out perfectly cheerful in excellent spirits and apparently on the best of terms with one another. One of the prisoners interviewed, a Jew, made some interesting statements about railways. All private traveling has been suspended. An individual can only travel with a special order, and this cannot be obtained except by communists and is only issued by commissaires. Nobody suspected of anti-Bolshevism can get an order. There are no tickets for sale. The railway service is chaotic, although quite a number of trains are in circulation and run eastwards from Moscow as far as Omsk. No one knows when they will reach their destinations. The carriages are filthy, and only commissaires may travel in the first or second class carriages. One prisoner presented a singular case of complete content with the Soviet regime. His one desire was to return to it. It is fair to say that he was not a communist and took no interest whatever in politics. He came from the Tambov government, from a small country town where he had been sublimely happy. There were no commissaires, there was no interference, there were merely a few intelligent people who had developed the Russian communal system and had established proper exchange between the urban and rural cooperatives, one of which he directed. He had to work hard, but could make a comfortable living, and, as he said, all the people in his district were good people, so his great hope was to return there. There were a system of licensed purchasers who were allowed to buy a given quantity of the various needs each month. But only good people could secure this license. When he was taken for the army in June, he was very angry. The most intelligent of the prisoners was a quartermaster sergeant, formerly a university student, who loathed Bolshevism. When questioned as to whether the Bolsheviks had any real intention of making peace with Poland, he smiled broadly and said that the last army order had been to finish off the Polish army and take Warsaw. Despite the promises of the commissaires, he maintained that even the capture of Warsaw would not have meant peace and that the next order after that would have been to march on across the German frontier. There was not the slightest doubt in his mind about this. The Bolsheviks were convinced that all Europe would be converted. None of these men had any idea of the extent of the Bolshevik disaster. They only knew that something had gone wrong. Most of them grinned with pleasure when informed of the defeat of the army to which they had belonged. They had belonged. Hey, idą strzelcy, morowcy wielcy. Hey, strzelcy, hey, strzelcy, hey, strzelcy są. Siwe kabaty, tu w nich rogaty. Hey, strzelcy, hey, strzelcy, hey, strzelcy są. Siwe mundury, a w butach dziury. Hey, strzelcy, hey, strzelcy, hey, strzelcy są. A nasi strzelce zdobyli kielce. Hej strzelcy, hej strzelcy, hej strzelcy są. A pod kielcami panny z kwiatami. Hej strzelcy, hej strzelcy, hej strzelcy są. Na samym przedzie Piłsudski jedzie. Hej strzelcy, hej strzelcy, hej strzelcy są. Departure from Warsaw. In train, Warsaw, Paris, 26th August 1920. We left Warsaw yesterday evening at 9 p.m. The last two days have been passed in an atmosphere of cordiality and congratulation. Recognition centers quite rightly on General Wegand, who has received many marks of public esteem. Up to now, the Poles have been rather slow both in understanding the magnitude of the victory and in expressing gratitude to those who have assisted in obtaining it. 
but they are now making up very handsomely for lost time, arriving Krakow in the morning. The mission was met by a deputation of the principal citizens who did everything possible to make the day interesting. The Polish government had sent down Prince Czartoryski, a great noble, to do the honors. In the evening, a banquet was offered by the municipality and masses of flowers presented by various ladies' associations, etc. Left Krakow at 9 p.m. and reached Prague early next morning. President Masaryk and the principal ministers offered the mission a luncheon. Happily, there were no speeches. I met for the first time Dr. Benesch, the foreign minister, and was much impressed with his intelligence and breadth of his survey. He has recently been to Siberia and Romania and has practically concluded a treaty for mutual defense with these countries. His language was approximately as follows. The whole of Central Europe is nervous from the war and excited. They want to be reassured and to settle down. They will not settle down unless they are confident of the strength to resist both aggression and internal trouble. If we can form a group between Czechoslovakia, Serbia, and Romania, and add Poland to this, we can be indifferent to any attack from the Soviets or from Russia, and we can also keep Hungary quiet. We should like to add Greece to our alliance, but the Serbians and Romanians think that Greece has undertaken more than she can execute, and that an alliance with her at the present time would involve more potential obligations than probable advantages. We shall, therefore, wait a little time before negotiating with Greece and admitting her to our alliance, though our feelings are quite friendly. About Bulgaria, the feeling in Serbia is favorable on the part of the soldiers, hostile on the part of the politicians. In Romania, it is exactly the opposite. The soldiers are hostile to Bulgaria, or afraid of Bulgaria, or jealous of Bulgaria, while the politicians are rather friendly. So here again we must wait. So far, Benish. What a difference victory makes. A month ago, the atmosphere here was secretly hostile to Poland. Today, exactly the reverse. Had the Anglo-French mission followed the advice given at Prague in July, we should have abstained from any action at Warsaw. In that case, what would have happened? Either victory would not have been won, and this I believe the most probable event, and one that would have been a disaster for all Europe. Or victory would have been won by the Poles alone, with Western Europe standing coldly aside. Would that have promoted the friendly feelings between the West and Poland, which are so desirable for European peace? Paris, 29th August, 1920 a most cordial telegram from the Prime Minister at Lucerne expressing appreciation at the invaluable services rendered by the British mission to Poland, the success of which has exceeded his most sanguine expectations. He desires me to express special thanks to General Radcliffe. I have also received a letter from Curzon congratulating me on services rendered to England and to Poland which have contributed very materially to the astounding and by us utterly unexpected recovery of that country, when the executioner's axe was already within an ace of its neck. Paris, 29th August, 1920. Radcliffe's judgment regarding military events is so calm and reasonable that importance attaches to all his opinions. He holds that the Polish army has won a victory as dramatic as any in history. All honor to Poland for her achievement, the merit of which is enhanced by the fact that the battle was fought while the Polish government was being urged by more than one friendly power to accept the conditions offered by the Soviets. Radcliffe stresses the point that victory has been obtained less by hard fighting than by skill in maneuver and by bold strategy. The Russian failure was due in a large measure to the fatal but not infrequent mistake of underrating the enemy. Paris, 1st September, 1920. The reception of the mission in Paris has been most cordial. It was enthusiastically cheered at the station on arrival, where a huge crowd greeted us. The whole mission proceeded yesterday to Versailles to pay a visit to Monsieur Milron. The reception was extremely friendly. From conversation with French officials, I gather that to some extent they share the apprehension felt in London, that the Poles will be unreasonable about their eastern frontier. I have endeavored to dispel anxiety on this head, as I have always found Prince Sapieha moderate and sensible on the subject.
I ventured to suggest that the importance of the French military mission to Poland is so great that they ought to select as the head of it the most capable officer at their disposal. The matter is one of importance not only for France, but for Europe. Paris, 2nd September, 1920. It is less than six weeks since we left London and Paris on what was then thought a hopeless mission. It would be difficult to compress more rapid changes of fortune into so short space of a time, or to experience a more violent contrast between expectation and actual event. The frustration of hope is the common lot of humanity. It is pleasant and refreshing to have been privileged to take part in an episode when reality so far outran anticipation. General Review of Fighting Round Warsaw General Review of the Fighting Near Warsaw, followed by individual narratives by the two commanders. I have thought that the best method to enable the reader to form an impartial judgment on the Battle of Warsaw is to supplement my own survey, which is given below, by accounts of the battle furnished by the two commanders-in-chief. It is possible to do this for generals Piłsudski and Tukhachevsky, at the head respectively of the Polish and Russian armies, have both compiled full narratives. Characteristic extracts from these will enable the reader to check my own review of events. The following is my survey. It would be a profound mistake to regard the fighting in Poland as being similar in any essential particular to that in the Great War. It should be classified with a totally different period, probably some 200 years earlier, and belongs by its leading characteristics to an antecedent era of civilization and to an earlier stage in the development of the art of war. Both the Polish and Soviet armies were 18th century rather than modern in many respects, particularly in this that there was no special animosity or rancor between the masses of combatants on the two sides. They were in the fight either through compulsion and fear of being shot at home or because there was no other immediately available means of livelihood. In the Soviet army there was no particular enthusiasm for the cause for which they were fighting, and there was a definite hatred for the direct representatives of that cause. As regards the actual combat, it may be said that the fighting was less brutal than it was in the Great War. There were no savage attacks, there was no question of any heroic resistance. It was a war of maneuver and of position. The game of war was conducted on lines similar to chess between high-class players. Directly one side had a serious advantage, the other side resigned and withdrew to another table or another field. When considerably outnumbered, outmaneuvered or outflanked, the troops either retired or surrendered. Authority among their officers was insufficient to induce them to take any other course. Thus, the number of killed and wounded was not large when compared with great war standards. The mobility of the troops on both sides was remarkable, especially that of the Poles. They covered distances unattainable by the best European armies, and this on poor rations with or without boots. Their mobility was greatly increased by the fact that they were usually accompanied by light country carts, two ponies harnessed to a ramshackle four-wheeled vehicle, built on lines somewhat similar to a miniature brewer's dray. These rattled along behind the troops, both by day and by night, picking up the wary and footsore, giving others an occasional lift. These country carts were also used to take captured prisoners back from the front, the drivers being generally willing to give anybody a lift, whether friend or captured enemy. Poland may be considered an ideal country to fight in. I have not seen any European general, particularly any general of cavalry, whose military ardor has not been stirred on surveying it. There are no big obstacles, there is enough wood to afford concealment and facilitate surprise, the rivers are few, and crossing them is just as difficult enough to afford some scope for ingenuity and engineering knowledge. It is essentially a country for military maneuver, and it is maneuvering capacity and by mobility that battles here are decided. Nothing illustrates more correctly the general nature of the warfare than the behavior of prisoners and the methods of treatment applied to them. The usual demeanor of the Soviet prisoners I saw, and I saw large numbers of them at stages of captivity varying from five minutes to a month, was that 
of relief and relative satisfaction. They realized that they were more or less safe, that they would have adequate, if not abundant, food, that there would be no Jewish commissaires to shoot them if they ran away, nor Chinese to torture them if they offended or spoke evil of the Soviet. It might be true that they had lost their chance of the pleasures of war, but they were apathetic about the joys of victory. They realized from past experience that the ultimate profit from sacking a town is greater in theory than in effect, and that allied and associated pleasures may be easily overrated. So far as I have seen, the Polish officers and authorities were neither harsh nor cruel. They treated the prisoners just as well as they treated their own soldiers, and the prisoners showed no signs of being bullied. I perceived very little resentment against the ordinary prisoners on the part of the villagers, although they would kill a commissaire. They talked with the former quite affably and gave them a lift to prison camp on their carts. A common hatred of Jewish commissaires and usurers making them wondrous kind. One soldier with a bayonet was often given charge of a squad of twenty or thirty prisoners. Sometimes an unarmed peasant would bring in two or three Bolsheviks. Judging after the event, one can see that Bolshevik strategy on invading ethnographical Poland was faulty in the extreme. Instead of concentrating on the capture of Warsaw and marching direct for it, they distributed their strength on several objectives. A. Cutting the corridor between Danzig and Warsaw, probably near Grudziądz, and to this end sending a considerable force along the German frontier. B. Endeavoring to cross the Vistula at Wrocławek and Płock. C. Endeavoring to cross the Vistula above Warsaw at Gura Kalvaria. The credit of designing the plan which led to so great a success, viewed broadly, was due to Polish initiative. But one must add this, without General Vagant there would probably have been no plan, or possibly there would have been a great many plans vaguely discussed and not one firmly adopted and carried out. General Vagan's personal energy in supervising the details and execution and bringing order and method to the operations of the Polish force were essential to success. Without them, the plan might have well failed. General Vagan also rendered marked service by bringing the officers of the French mission into close contact with the troops at the front. Their presence undoubtedly infused the troops with new life and vigor. General Vagan's share in the victory is therefore a very large one, and he thoroughly deserved all the honors he received from the Polish and French governments. General Radcliffe also deserves high praise for his sound judgment and his close cooperation with General Vagan. His loyal support went far to maintain the authority of Vagan at Polish headquarters. The increased confidence produced by the arrival of the Anglo-French mission may be estimated from the difference of tone apparent at Warsaw between 24th July, when we arrived, and 15th August, when the Polish army achieved so notable a victory. Had there been no mission, or had we been unsuccessful in establishing communication between Warsaw and Danzig, or again, had we failed to inspire the Polish government with reliance on the support to be expected from the Western powers, I have little doubt that Tukhachevsky's view would have been justified, and that the Polish army, driven back so far, would have been incapable of serious resistance and impotent to prevent the Bolshevik troops from capturing Warsaw. To the credit of the Polish nation, it is to be recorded that when they realized the services rendered by General Vagand, which was not until 23rd August, they made up by a tardy enthusiasm for all previous coldness. The last two days in Warsaw before our departure on 25th August were a veritable triumph for the general, who had not only received the cross of the order of the military virtue, but was presented with a sword of honor, of a unique kind in the shape of the actual sword belonging to Stefan Batory, King of Poland, from 1572 to 1584. General Radcliffe was also presented with the Polish Military Medal for services under fire, and received other testimonies of recognition for his admirable work. 
other facts to the credit of the Poles. There was no undue elation and no boasting after the Russian defeat. The streets maintained the normal attitude which they had preserved throughout the crisis. There had been no sign of panic or alarm when the Bolsheviks were within 15 miles of the capital. There was no exuberant rejoicing when 60,000 of the enemy had been taken prisoner and the entire force which had menaced Warsaw was in full flight. Marshal Piłsudski's Narrative I remember distinctly, and it is with pleasure that I recall the fact that one day, whilst examining the sketch of the daily position as shown by the reports received, I noted something quite unexpected, and which I had never met with until then, namely that the division on the right wing of our first army, the first Lithuanian white army, had been forestalled in its retreat towards the west by the Soviet fourth army so that it had been obliged to bend somewhat strongly its exposed right wing. Moreover, Tukhachevsky himself admits that the resistance of our first army on the Narev line was the first somewhat serious obstacle which he encountered on his march to the Vistula. But, in the decision which I had to arrive at, at this time, it was no longer a case of changing individuals. It became necessary to alter on a large scale the organization of the command and to see that suitable people were given charge of appropriate missions. To have acted in any other way would have endangered the possibility of our resuming the initiative at the opportune moment. These two duties, which did not form part of the subjects under discussion, were thrust upon me, and the first was an almost crushing one, inasmuch as the very basis of such a duty was of a necessity and absurdity, both strategically and logically. It was this duty which I had more especially to take into account when I was endeavoring to arrive at a decision on the evening of the 5th August, and during the night from the 5th to the 6th, not as the result of advice, but alone in my study at the Belvedere. There is on record an admirable expression made by the greatest authority on the human soul in wartime, Napoleon, who said of himself that when about to take an important decision in the war, he was like a girl giving birth to a child. Since that night I have often been reminded of the profound subtlety of Napoleon's thought. He who despised the weakness of the fair sex compares himself, a giant in will and genius, to a weak young woman on her bed, a prey to the pains of labor. He used to say of himself that in those moments he was pusillanimous. I, myself, a prey to the same pusillanimity, could not overcome the absurdity of the theme of the battle, which condemned the bulk of my forces gathered at Warsaw to passive resistance. In my opinion, the counterattack could not be launched from Warsaw nor from Modlin. This would mean a frontal attack against the main forces of the enemy, which, as I thought, were concentrated before Warsaw, and up to that time neither our forces nor our command had been able to hold the victorious enemy. Besides, the nightmare of defeat and the excuses of poltroons were sweeping over the whole town. A striking proof of this is to be found in the despatch of the delegation ordered to sue for peace. I, myself, had come to the conclusion that Warsaw should adopt a passive role, namely resisting the pressure to which she was about to be subjected from outside. Nevertheless, at that moment I did not wish to impose this passive role on the majority of our forces. 
But when I again contemplated the possibility of a reduction of the garrison, thus condemned to inactivity, I began to think that Warsaw would not be able to hold out, and the departure of any of the troops already concentrated there might bring about a further weakening of morale. From a study of what had taken place at Lvov, I was quite aware of what a large town is like when the fighting is being carried out at its doors, and that in the streets the troops at the rear would be circulating in all directions, as was the case in Warsaw. The soldier in such moments is obliged to share the life of the town, and every change of feeling in the population, in one direction or another, destroys or strengthens the morale of the combatant. I remembered very well that the greater part of the troops assembled in Warsaw arrived in the capital after a long series of reverses, after repeated and serious defeats. Any reduction of their number or the withdrawal from the capital of units already there appeared to me dangerous. Was one of them to condemn to passivity ten divisions, practically half of the Polish forces? That was the question I asked myself. The extraordinary energy displayed by General Sosnkowski in all that concerned Warsaw caused attention to be drawn to the enormous proportion of our artillery in the garrison, a proportion without precedent in our army. It nearly approached the proportion considered ideal in standards drawn from the Great War. I hesitated to place my trust in the morale of the troops and in that of the inhabitants, and I could not be sure of the military and civil authorities. The first thing that struck me was the slow retreat of our fourth army from the book. The natural direction in which the enemy was pushing it was bringing it on to the Vistula between Warsaw and Dęblin. Now, in that direction, there were neither bridges nor any other means of crossing. In the event of the enemy pushing vigorously into the center, our fourth army might be driven into a corner on the Vistula and find itself in an extremely critical position. It was, therefore, necessary to incline it either towards Warsaw or towards Dęblin, or, alternatively, divide it into two sections, one diverted to the north and the other to the south. In this way, if the whole or part were divided to the south, one would have forces independent of Warsaw, and this, again, necessitated a defensive force for the left bank of the Vistula between Warsaw and Dęblin. Such a move involved an increase of the passive troops and a reduction of the troops available for attack. The morale of the Fourth Army did not inspire confidence. The unexpected loss of Brzezc did not encourage me to place much reliance on them. I had a second reserve of troops in the south, from which I had already drawn the 18th Division of Infantry. The south was in a much better position than the north and the exceptional fighting ability and indomitable activity of its commanding officers was well in evidence from the morale of the troops drawn from there. A levy on this force was rendered easier by the fact that Budionny's cavalry had been thrown back so that our train movements could not be hampered by an active enemy cavalry. When, however, I considered the question of withdrawal of troops from the south, I reverted to the conclusion that I must not weaken the forces there to any considerable extent. The victory over Budionne was by no means complete, and while it might seem impossible for him to undertake a new offensive for some time, it might well be that, if I attempted to weaken our forces at this point, the enemy cavalry who had done so much harm in the past might recommence their activities. And the most natural movement, and the one most dangerous for us, would be the concentration of all the Soviet forces. Thus I came to the conclusion that I could only withdraw two regiments of infantry from the south, with perhaps a brigade of cavalry. Such a small force could hardly strengthen to any great extent the force of the counter-attack, nor could it have a great influence on the morale of the other troops. On taking into account all these facts, the sole conclusion to which I could come was that for the counter-attack. I could not count on more than three or four divisions of infantry reinforced by a small body of cavalry. And what was that in the face of an enemy who, up until now, had constantly broken the resistance of the greater part of our army? All my endeavors were paralyzed by this fundamental absurdity, by her weakness and the excessive risk involved.
The whole situation appeared to me gloomy and desperate, the only bright spot on my horizon being the disappearance of the cavalry in our rear, and the powerlessness of the 12th Soviet Army who were unable to recover from the defeat which they had experienced in the Ukraine. The reorganization of the command was relatively clear. From the moment it became necessary for the greater part of the troops to be closely concentrated at Warsaw and its surroundings, the need for unified command was obvious, although the number of troops centered there would have justified division into two armies. Our counter-attack had to be commanded by a single chief. The most difficult task fell on the force which, although the weaker, was contrary to all common sense, about to undertake the decisive move. I decided in the first place not to ask any of my subordinates to assume the responsibility of a scheme of such impractical character, seeing that, as commander-in-chief, I choose this absurdity as the starting point of my operations. It seemed only right that I should assume the responsibility for carrying out the most absurd part of the plan, and, as a matter of principle, I decided that the troops for the counter-attack should be commanded by me in person. Moreover, this thought pleased me in the sense that during the time of execution of this operation, I should not be exposed to the suggestions of cowards and the sophisms of the incompetent. After having compared alternative schemes, I decided on two things. To withdraw towards the south the major part of our 4th Army, and to take from the existing forces in the south, for the purpose of strengthening the counter-attacking forces, the two divisions which I considered the best, the first and the third of the legion. When, on the morning of the 6th, General Rozdabadovsky reported to my office for orders, he arrived with a sketch outline which presented a new proposition or plan. This was in regard to the mission of the 4th Army, which had evidently been obliged to withdraw to a sector of the Vistula unprovided with bridges and necessary means of crossing this large obstacle. On the sketch map, General Rozvadovsky had endeavored to utilize means of withdrawal of the 4th Army so as to concentrate, as far as I can remember, in the vicinity of Garvolin, certain divisions of this army. Hence, on the supposition that the enemy would frankly concentrate their forces before Warsaw, he recommended, with this group held in hand, an attack towards the north, that is to say, towards Warsaw. I immediately rejected this proposal. I pointed out that a concentration of troops under such conditions seemed to me an extremely doubtful move. The enemy, who so far had been superior to us, could easily stop such a change of front, and our force would either be driven into Warsaw or, worse still, driven back on the Vistula, at risk of a catastrophe. I decided at once that the 4th Army was to retire in greater part to the south, to concentrate there and prepare for a counter-attack. On the other hand, I ordered a levy on our southern forces of two divisions, the 1st and 3rd of the Legion, to reinforce the troops which would be taking part in the counter-attack. After a short discussion, we chose for our area of concentration the country covered by the Viepsch. This enabled us to rest our left wing on Demblin and protect the bridges over the Vistula and the Viepsch. It was on this basis that the order of 6th August was drafted. My main order, preparatory to the battle, was drawn up almost at the same moment as that of Tukhachevsky. When I compare these two orders, I deeply regret not having been able to, at that moment, to have had a glimpse of the secret plan of campaign as made by Tukhachevsky. How my mind would have been relieved, how many easier solutions could have been found, if I could have known or even supposed with a certain degree of probability that Tukhachevsky had not intended that all his troops should be used for the attack on Warsaw. If I had known how his troops had been split up into two sections, that the object of two of his armies was not to attack Warsaw, but to carry out a long march, and the crossing, perhaps longer still, of a large river, the Vistula, I might have been saved the anxiety I felt for the safety of Warsaw. I am almost convinced that I need not have tortured my mind regarding the fundamental absurdity which I had taken as the basis of my decisions. The two Soviet armies would necessarily lose much time on their march, and time at this moment was of great value. Such a loss of time to the enemy was gain for me. 
If I had realized the position, I should perhaps have endeavored to take advantage of the concentration of my own troops to maneuver along the interior lines and defeat the enemy piecemeal. Perhaps even I should have ordered our fourth army to retreat on Warsaw and nowhere else. The absurdity of my general order of operations was made worse by the fact that the passive groups were already concentrated, or would be concentrated by a retreat in the most natural and easy direction. The real doubt as to the success of the project proceeded from the active group, the group of attack. As a matter of fact, the troops which formed part of this group were in immediate contact and in some cases actively engaged with the enemy, and the direction to be followed in order to reach the base where the troops were to concentrate demanded a complicated maneuver. It was for this reason that the divisions of the 4th, 14th, 16th and 21st armies, who were still on the 6th and the 7th August, engaged in violent combat on the book, needed not only to be disengaged from the enemy, but further to make a dangerous, practically flank march in order to reach the position south of Riepsch. This applied above all to the 14th Division, which was the farthest north, near Janov, who had to make the longest oblique march in order to reach Demblin. An unfavorable incident of any sort, more energetic pressure of the enemy at such and such a point, the lowering of the morale, which had been so frequent up to the present and which might occur in any division or regiment, any of these happenings might endanger the whole maneuver, and it was a question whether the shock troops that I had decided to command myself could be concentrated in time, and would be capable of performing the duty I had placed on them. The situation was still more difficult for the two divisions which I should be drawing from the south with a view to assisting the counter-attack, namely the 1st and 3rd legion. I proposed to reinforce them with a small body of cavalry, which naturally had greater facility in breaking contact. As to the two divisions of infantry separated by a distance of from 150 to 250 kilometers from the concentration base and in contact with the enemy, their task was, as I thought then and as I still think, beyond average human capacity. Inwardly, I calculated, despite the different wording of the order, that General Ritz Schmigwe, to whom fell the responsibility of this undertaking, would succeed in reaching the concentration base with only one division of infantry assisted by one brigade of cavalry. As for the other division, to which I had likewise given the order to march towards the north, I hardly dared think about it. It is therefore not surprising that from the 6th to the 12th I followed the development of this dangerous maneuver with feverish interest. During those days, careful study of the enemy's movements and maneuvers did not lead me to suspect in the least that the troops of Tukhachevsky were carrying out his order of the 8th, avoiding Warsaw. It is true that I certainly noted some movement towards the west, that is to say, towards the Vistula, below Modlin. Chekhanov and Muava had certainly been attacked, and I had also considered unimportant the movements in the direction of Płock and Wrocławek. These were cavalry movements which, as I thought, were aimed at cutting the communications of Warsaw with Danzig. With regard to the retreat of the divisions of our fourth army, this was carried out practically without difficulties. Because the enemy had openly directed their 16th army towards the north, the left wing of this army following the road brzezcz Warsaw. As soon as the divisions of our 4th army had crossed this road in order to proceed to the south towards the Wiepsch, enemy pressure ceased. I could thus be sure that the three divisions would gain the protection behind the Wiepsch and be at my disposal. General Ridzschmigwe carried out his mission in a most skillful manner. The operations undertaken by him and the maneuvers of his two divisions, the first and third, constitute one of the most glorious exploits in the history of the Polish army. General Ridzschmigwe and his two divisions succeeded in solving a complicated mission by adopting an aggressive attitude. The fighting of the 1st and 3rd Divisions of Infantry of the Legion in the South was marked by a curious result. On one of our officers who was killed near Helm, the enemy found a copy of our order of 6th August which commanded a new formation of our forces. This imprudence, so frequent in war and so severely punished by all army rules, was the cause of the secret of our movements falling into the hands of the Soviets. 
I have since read Tukhachevsky and Sergeyev's statements that the GHQ of the Soviet did not in the least believe in the genuineness of this document, for the 12th Soviet Army had reported that at Khrubyashov the divisions destined to attack towards the north, the first and third, were fighting desperately in the south and not in the neighborhood of Lubartov whither the order of the sixth sent them. Tukhachevsky states that he had discussions on this subject with his superior officer, but he did nothing to protect his left wing or his menaced rear, which were in danger. Before leaving Warsaw on the evening of the 12th, I had arranged for a final interview with three leading personalities. In the course of this interview, I proclaimed my views on the situation as follows. Of the twenty divisions of infantry taking part in the battle which was to decide the fate of our capital, about fifteen, that is to say three quarters of them, would assume a passive role, and about one quarter, that is to say five and a half divisions, of which one was delayed, would take an active part in attack. Warsaw, where there were assembled ten and a half divisions, possessed considerable artillery, and I was assured that the artillery fire, in combination with aeroplanes, also assembled there, would suffice to keep the enemy back. I did not consider, therefore, that the factor of time was to be of such great importance to Warsaw. I therefore held the view that it was better for the general scheme of operations that the enemy should suffer heavy losses in attacking Warsaw and should be closely held by the Warsaw garrison so that it would not be possible for them to rush troops to resist the advance of the five divisions which I commanded. 2. I pointed out that the troops assembled for the counter-attack, that is, five and a half divisions, should have sufficient time to rest themselves and reorganize after being joined by reinforcements. It was also necessary for me to have a certain amount of time to inspect the troops, for I feared that their state of morale was not sufficiently strong to undertake an operation as delicate as it was dangerous. Also, I did not think I should be able to commence operations before 15th August. At the same time, I believed that two days after the commencement of operations, I should succeed in drawing near enough to Warsaw for my divisions to cooperate with the major part of the forces assembled there. I figured that it would eventually be desirable for the southern sector of the garrison of Warsaw, reinforced by all the artillery possible, to assemble in this sector and commence an attack along the line of Warsaw to Minsk and Brescht. Indeed, my intention was to attack on a very large front, and in these circumstances the 14th Division of Infantry, which formed the left wing and which had to follow the Lublin road, would find itself in a very critical position since, if entirely isolated, it would come up against the main body of enemy forces. 3. I pointed out the menace which had the movement I was about to direct extraordinarily dangerous. In withdrawing from the south the first and third divisions of the legion, I in reality left a large and dangerous gap open to the Budionne cavalry. Although in this district our cavalry had been ordered to stop the advance of Budionne, previous experience did not inspire great confidence. I apprehended that all or a section of the Budionne cavalry would debouch from the Sokal or from Khrubyashov and thus annihilate my projected scheme. I pointed out also that on the book I only possessed a very weak force to stand up against the 12th Soviet army. Finally, when taking leave of General Sosnkovsky, I drew his attention to the disorder which reigned, not only in the command, but in the reorganization of the troops, and asked him to do everything possible to eliminate the various groupings and groups, subgroups, supergroups, advance groups, and rear groups. In certain cases, 100 soldiers were split up into three groups, each commanded by a general. I advised him also to make a great effort to be a tutelary guide to the generals who were continually discussing and disputing, and to bring to an end the anarchy of command which I so feared. In my absence the defense of the town might be compromised at the very moment when we had a real superiority over the enemy. Having settled these questions I left Warsaw on the evening of the 12th.
I left with a deep feeling of the absurdity of the situation, and even with a certain disgust of myself, because the weakness and powerlessness of the Poles forced me to go against all sense and logic and all the sane laws of warfare. Indeed, I own that I experienced a sense of relief in leaving the place where minutes became hours, hours days, and days weeks. On my arrival at Puave, which I made my headquarters, I came to several conclusions. Firstly, that the morale of all the divisions, and there were four concentrated there, was not so bad as I expected, although just before my arrival one of the divisions, the 21st, had abandoned the bridgehead at Kotsk on the Vieprz when attacked by the enemy. I did not believe, however, that this loss of morale was beyond remedy. On the other hand, I ascertained that reinforcements had been badly distributed in view of the armaments in their possession. Battalions armed with French rifles had been placed in divisions armed with German Mausers or Austrian Mannlicher rifles. I noted, moreover, the very poor state of the equipment and uniforms of the troops. I had never in all my experience of warfare seen such ragamuffins, as I called them. In the 21st Division, half of the men appeared before me at Firre. I recalled the many times various of my practically naked, their defeats entirely to the bad equipment of the troops. Also, it was the regret that I realized that the best part of the supplies had been allotted to the troops who were not taking part in the counterattack. Finally, the information I was able to obtain regarding the enemy was rather vague. In accordance with the strategical plan, I should have had facing me the Morzerz group. The composition and strength of this group had never been precisely ascertained by us. We knew that the 57th Division of Infantry came into this group, and in addition, other detachments formed a sort of independent section. Up to the present, however, I had no reliable information. Their previous activities were liable to make one think that it was a very large group. Since the 4th of July, they had attacked in two different directions. Since the 4th of July, they had attacked in two different directions, and at the very place where we were strongest, along the so-called Polesie, and more to the north, along the bank of the Bobruisk Brescht. Occasionally, during the previous month, I had read reports which spoke of important enemy troops attacking us, not without success, and sometimes in one direction, sometimes in another. And yet, on the date of 13th August, there appeared to be no enemy forces facing me. There were, at the most, patrols, slightly more numerous than perhaps towards Kotsk and Maciejowice. I own I took these for partisans sent across the country to requisition and plunder. Reports from Warsaw were reassuring. The enemy, according to all accounts, was preparing to attack and was concentrating forces accordingly. Nor did the South send any alarming news. The impression I formed at Warsaw was confirmed. I had time in front of me, and I decided not to commence my attack before the morning of 17th August, when the attack on Warsaw would be already underway and the Soviet forces would be closely engaged by the main body of our Warsaw force. This would give me time to fuse my divisions into one group, hoping that the third division of the Legion, delayed in its march towards the north, would arrive and take its place with the other divisions. But on the following day the situation went wrong. Agonized telegrams arrived from Warsaw. The first Soviet attack had broken through our resistance. Radzimin and its surroundings had been taken by assault. The telegrams described in an alarming fashion the general feeling in the capital. I experienced a certain surprise when I learned that the pressure brought to bear by Tukhachevsky's troops increased in the direction of Płock, even at Wotswavek and Brodnica. The telegrams conveying this news spoke not only of cavalry, as I had expected, but of other arms. This was a puzzle I could not solve, because it was so entirely opposed to my previous conviction, namely that Tukhachevsky had concentrated all his forces against Warsaw. These alarming messages were intended to bring pressure on me to fly to the help of the capital or to force me to take the offensive at once, without waiting for the completion of my preparation. I therefore communicated with Warsaw to the effect that I would commence the attack at dawn on the 16th instead of the 17th as I had previously planned.
I had given my troops, that is to say my four divisions, as general objective the road Brzezcz Warsaw, which should be reached on the second day. On the 15th August, the news from Warsaw was more reassuring, but the fighting tended to prove that the pressure of the enemy centered more and more in the direction of Radzimin and to the north of Warsaw in the direction of Modlin. On the other hand, to the south, Budyonny's cavalry had started an offensive, and our southern army was forced under pressure to make a movement in the direction of Lvov. On the 16th, I let loose the attack, if one can call it an attack. Only the 21st Division of Infantry came into action and engaged in a light and easy combat. Some days before, this division had evacuated Kotsk and had destroyed the bridge. Now they had to ford the Vieps before reoccupying Kotsk. The other divisions made good progress, practically without encountering the enemy, save for a few skirmishes of no importance here and there with small parties who, as soon as they came into contact, dispersed and fled. It could hardly be called a real attack. I spent the whole day motoring principally to the 14th Division of Infantry on the left wing, collecting information and general impressions. I must say that by the evening all divisions had covered 30 or more kilometers towards the north. The Mozesh group, however, was a mystery. Though part of the Soviet 57th Division of Infantry, no one had come into contact with it. This was quite contrary to my previous conclusions. Moreover, it was before this imaginary apocalyptic beast that several of our divisions had been retreating. It was like a dream. There was a trap somewhere. My troops continued to advance and still there was no enemy. I ordered the second division of the legion to form a reserve to my advanced troops, for I felt that we were menaced by mysteries and traps on all sides. It seemed certain that the Moser group, which had so far been victorious, must be somewhere, and the same reflections applied to the 16th army attacking Warsaw. The 17th August came, but brought no solution to these enigmas. I spent the whole day motoring, seeking for traces of the phantom enemy, and endeavoring to discover the traps which I feared. The next day, the 18th, I proceeded to Kobiel, where I ascertained that the 14th Division had fought a battle in the night and were now advancing to Minsk, in accordance with my orders. On arrival at Minsk, I discovered that the Bolshevik 16th Army had retreated in panic and disorder. The 14th Division reached Minsk and concentrated there, as did the 15th Regiment of Ulans. From information received from our 14th Division, it was evident that their encounter with the most southern forces of the Soviet 16th Army had resulted in only slight losses to the Polish forces and in the complete rout and panic of the Soviets. It was also ascertained that, in compliance with orders, one wing of the Warsaw garrison, the 15th Division, had attacked on the Warsaw Minsk Road and had actually reached the vicinity of Dembevielke. I then gave orders for the fusion of the 15th Division with our 4th Army and for them to march north and force the river Buk, as three of the enemy divisions, the 8th, 10th and 17th, had been routed it was evident that but small resistance would be met from the remaining divisions, the 2nd and the 7th. On the 18th of August, I left for Warsaw with the object of giving orders for the final grouping of the troops. On arrival there, I found the general feeling to be very different from that which I had expected. Contrary to my hope that everyone would have been joyful at the turn of events, it was a source of disappointment and surprise to find that most of the people to whom I spoke did not consider our strategic position as favorable and as radically changed as I thought myself. There was in some cases a certain sense of relief that Warsaw itself was not so hardly pressed by the enemy, but much discontent and disquietude was apparent on account of enemy attacks on the towns of the lower Vistula, such as Płock, Wrocławek, etc., and of the progress of the Soviet troops in the direction of what was called the Danzig Corridor. Piłsudski had a hard struggle to persuade his companies that they were in truth already victorious. They persisted in believing in the existence of danger from the Russian right and in the menace of encirclement from the West. How was it possible that the tide of victory should have been turned so suddenly? Could it be believed that the enemy hosts, which had swept all before them for nearly two months, could have collapsed suddenly as if struck by the wand of a magician? They did not lend credence to the reality of their own success until, between 18th and 22nd August, the Polish 4th Army succeeded in taking Sniadów. 
From this time on, they realized that the Soviet army was not only defeated, but it was retreating in utter panic. On 22nd August, Polish troops took Womża, and after it, the bridge over the Narew. This made the position secure, and soon after, following a short but severe battle, the Soviet 4th Army was forced over the frontier of eastern Prussia and was there disarmed. Thus ended the critical phase of the historic Battle of Warsaw. So far in this volume, the events have been described from the Polish side. The standpoint has been that of the menaced and beleaguered capital of Poland. It is interesting to compare this account with a remarkable narrative of the same events seen from the Russian side. The commander of the Russian forces, Tukhachevsky, delivered a series of lectures at the military academy in Moscow between the 7th and 10th February 1923, entitled The Advance Beyond the Vistula. These conferences constitute an historical document of rare value. In no other campaign has the commander of the defeated side given an account of his proceedings with equal clarity and frankness. With a view to clarity and to adjustment to the preceding narrative, I have omitted those passages which refer to the earlier fighting on the Dvina and the Bereshina, connecting myself to events bearing directly upon the attack on Warsaw. The first observation which suggests itself on a pursuit of this remarkable narrative is the close concordance between the account given from the Russian side and that written from Warsaw. The Russian commander recognizes the disastrous effect of the dispersal of his forces, notably the failure by the 4th Army to cooperate on the right and by the Southwest Army to cooperate on the left. He is probably right in attributing his defeat in large part to these two diversions of force. He also confirms what has been written regarding his failure to attack Warsaw frontally with a concentrated force. He attempts to justify his action on the ground that his army was not sufficiently strong or well equipped to risk all on a direct attack. Apart from the reasons given above, he was lured by the great prize he would have secured if he had succeeded in capturing the whole of the Polish government by an encirclement of the capital. He would thus have destroyed any hope of effective resistance by Poland and would have cleared the road to the heart of Europe. The very title of his lectures, namely The Advance Beyond the Vistula, is an indication of the vast propagandist hopes which inspired Russian leaders. It is also probable that his preference for an indirect and encircling attack was inspired by the complete success which had attended this method throughout the Russian advance from the Dvina. In every case where the Poles held a strong position, the Russians passed around it and undermined Polish morale by creating the impression that the position had been turned or enveloped. They were not unmindful of the Lenin maxim that true strategy consists in deferring attack until the morale of the enemy has been so undermined that victory can be made both certain and complete. Had the Russians succeeded in carrying out the successful crossing of the Vistula, either above or below Warsaw, there can be little doubt that the effect on the morale of the town would have been such as gravely to compromise its successful defense. The messages sent from Warsaw on the 13th and 14th August to Piłsudski and Sikorski after the first attack on Radzymin are definite proof that news of Russian forces on the left bank of the Vistula behind Warsaw would have created something like a panic in the town. Psychologically, Tukhachevsky was probably right in his diagnosis. It is due in the main to the vigorous defense put up by Sikorsky and the 5th Army that this correct diagnosis did not lead to a Russian victory. Failure by the Russian right to drive Sikorsky back was perhaps one of the greatest surprises of the whole campaign, for it was known to the Russian commander that the 5th Army was badly equipped, composed of discordant elements, and to a considerable degree demoralized. The stand made by them may be attributed to the military talents of their commanders.
General Tukhachevsky's narrative, our brilliant success and the continued retreat of the Polish army had finally destroyed the latter's fighting capacity. We were no longer opposed by organized troops. The complete demoralization, the absolute want of any confidence and the impossibility of success had undermined the morale both of leaders and men. The Poles sometimes retired without reason. There were hundreds of deserters. No provost marshal could restore order or discipline. And, above all, there was the antagonism between class and class. Workmen's centers had been strangled by the mobilization, but the murmur of revolt continued among them. Assisted by French staff officers, supplied with arms and rations despatched from France, Poland, although defeated, applied herself feverishly to the work of restoration. Everything was pushed on with extreme rapidity. The trenches round Warsaw were reinforced. The line from Modlin to Warsaw was strengthened and troops were concentrated there from all parts. If, at the moment of our encounters on the Niemen and the Stara, the balance of force was on our side. In Poland, the numerical preponderance was profoundly modified. Our western front comprised at the highest estimate 40,000 rifles, whereas the Polish forces, according to information then available, amounted to 70,000 men. The number, in truth, was greater. The Polish command, understanding that the continuation of fighting in retreat could lead to no success, took a bold decision on 6th August, probably not without the participation of the French general staff. This decision was to break contact with our pursuing forces and to proceed to carry out a fresh grouping of the whole Polish front. The Polish commander realized that the decisive battle would be fought on the Vistula and he concentrated his forces there. From Lwów, almost all the Polish units were recalled. Only Ukrainian irregulars were left, together with a small force of infantry. This small body was entrusted with the duty of protecting the petroleum district. All the rest were sent north by rail. The Polish command took the risk of losing Galicia, but hoped to win the main battle and thus save bourgeois Poland. That was why the whole army concentrated on the Vistula. On our side, the following was the position. Our western forces were weakened and exhausted physically, but the morale was good, and they did not fear the enemy. The latter, although, two or three times as numerous as we were, could not resist our attack. The spirit of the offensive and of victory carried our troops forward, but if one proceeds to calm a study of our strategical position, the impression is less favorable. Already at the commencement of the Polish campaign, the problem of combination between our western front and our southwestern front had been taken into consideration. At that moment, the high command considered that unification of the two forces would be premature, and that a combination could be wisely postponed until after we had passed the meridian of Brzezcz-Litovsk. There is no doubt that the Polesian marshes constituted a real obstacle to any close cooperation between our western and southwestern fronts. So the above decision was entirely logical. But when we had proceeded farther west, the task of unifying the two forces became almost impracticable in view of the complete absence of means of communication. As a result, the southwestern and the western forces could not combine. The former devoted itself to a local objective, namely the capture of the town of Lwów, the capital of Galicia. To achieve this, the southwestern army advanced in a direction at the right angles to the line of the advance of the west. The situation was thus most unfavorable for the western front, for when they debouched into the plains of the Vistula, they were isolated in the presence of the whole Polish army. Information received by our staff led us to believe that all the Polish forces in the southwest had not been moved, but were still there. We had no information that the enemy had transferred troops from the south to the Vistula. The question became still more complicated in view of the fact that our western forces had to fight in two directions, towards Lwów and towards the Crimea, from which Wrangel was advancing. The continuous success by the western forces left us no doubt as to final victory. We intended, therefore, after this was accomplished, to withdraw troops from the western and southwestern fronts and despatch them towards the Crimea. This scheme was so much in our minds that we had some difficulty in not allowing troops to be detached before the main battle. 
Broadly viewed, the strategic position was as follows. The Poles had carried through their bold logical redistribution. They risked the loss of Galicia and concentrated all their force against our western front, which was the decisive point. Our troops at the supreme moment were scattered and faced different directions. The efforts of our supreme command to regroup our southwestern forces against Lublin were unfortunately not successful. French and Polish authors are fond of comparing the Battle of the Vistula with the Battle of the Marne, but there is no resemblance. On the other hand, a perfectly true comparison does exist, namely that with the operations in 1914 in eastern Prussia. There, Rennenkampf had assumed the task of taking Krulewiec and had advanced with all his army in a northwestern direction, while Hindenburg retreated to the southeast towards the wing of General Samsonov. This allowed Hindenburg to concentrate all his forces against half the Russian army. The Decisive Attack in the meantime, our offensive operations were pursued without interruption. There was no time for hesitation or rest. The final solution had to be achieved. Instructions were repeatedly given in this sense and were finally endorsed on 12th August by instructions from the commander-in-chief to capture Warsaw as soon as possible. As concerns the Western Front, it was clear that the bulk of the enemy forces had been concentrated so as to oppose our attempt to cross the Vistula in the region Chechanów modlin warsaw We therefore sent no less than 14 divisions of chasseurs and cavalry in this direction. Taking into consideration the high spirits of our troops, we felt that we had the right to count on a certain victory on this flank. The vast outflanking movement carried throughout by our troops deserves attention. This movement was based on a powerful foundation, for if the enemy counterattacked north of the Vistula, our northern force was concentrated there and could envelop the enemy. If, on the other hand, the white Polish troops felt themselves unable to beat us in the open field and retired behind the Vistula, we should be able to carry through the difficult operation of crossing the Vistula on a broad front. On the 6th August, the Polish headquarters drew up the following plan of operations. The 1st Army, composed of four divisions of infantry, a brigade of cavalry, and a large number of volunteers, was concentrated around the bridgehead at Warsaw. This consisted of 40,000 rifles and sabers. The 2nd Army, consisting of 16,000 rifles, defended the Vistula to the south of Warsaw as far as Demblin. The 4th Army, composed of three divisions of infantry, was concentrated southwest of the Vieps in order to attack our advancing columns in the flank. This concentration of the 4th Army was covered by the 3rd Army composed of three divisions of infantry and a brigade of cavalry concentrated in the direction of Lublin. The 3rd and 4th Armies consisted of 22,000 rifles. The arrangement of the white Polish forces, though entirely logical under the circumstances, was open to criticism, for, although it led to a complete Polish victory, I venture to think that the forces concentrated in the direction of Lublin were dangerously insufficient. Had it not been for the errors committed on our side, the Polish plans would not only have been incapable of leading to an actual Polish victory, but would probably have led to a Polish disaster. 4. On our right, in the section of the line occupied by our 4th, 15th and 3rd armies, we had 12 divisions of infantry and 2 divisions of cavalry against 3.5 divisions of Polish infantry. We were thus in a position to deliver the enemy a crushing blow, uncovering his left wing and his line of communications. The following is a general review of the position. Our offensive had already lasted for five weeks, and during this time we had attempted in vain to discover the real center of the enemy forces, with a view to destroying it by a decisive attack. In every case, the Polish army had invariably escaped and avoided decisive combat. It was only on the Vistula that the Poles, reinforced by new formations, finally decided to fight. We did not know where we should meet with the main resistance. Would it be on the Vistula or beyond? What we did feel was that we should meet the bulk of the enemy forces somewhere and that we should crush them in a final encounter, and it seemed to us that here was the enemy facilitating our task. His fifth army, the weakest both numerically and morally, was proceeding to attack our 15th and 3rd armies, while his uncovered wing was exposed to our 4th army, the freshest and best trained of our forces. 
When he realized this, the commander of our front could hardly restrain his delight. The 15th and 3rd Soviet armies received orders to reply to the enemy's attack by a vigorous counteroffensive and to throw the enemy back behind the Vkra. In the meantime, as regards the 4th army, the orders were to cover Thorn and to attack the enemy in the flank and rear. The destruction of the 5th Polish army appeared certain, and in the event of this army being destroyed, the whole Polish scheme would come to grief. But the Poles had extraordinary luck. Our 4th army, under a new leader, had lost touch with general headquarters and did not comprehend the situation. Receiving no special orders, the commander scattered his units in the sector Wrocławek Płock. The 5th Polish army was thus saved without suffering great losses, although it had on its flank and rear our powerful 4th army with its division of chasseurs and its two divisions of cavalry. While the Polish army was in a monstrous and almost untenable position, with its flank exposed, it was able to arrest the offensive of our 3rd and 15th armies and push them to slowly retreat to the east. In the meantime, the 16th Soviet army cleared off the Polish units opposed to it and reached the various passages over the Vistula, but it was not able to hold its position owing to various counterattacks which resulted in combats ending with varying results. On the 13th August, the 12th Army finally came under the orders of the commander of the front. It would be about this time that this army intercepted an order addressed to the 3rd Polish Army, from which it was clear that the Poles were preparing for an offensive against our left wing in the region of the Wiepsz. It should be mentioned, however, that this order did not appear genuine to the Soviet general staff, as, according to information in their possession, the units mentioned in the Polish telegram were not attacking northwards, but were continuing to operate in the southwestern direction. Unfortunately, the telegram was genuine and authentic. The Polish counteroffensive. While our regroupment was going on, the Polish army commenced the offensive and easily crushed the Mozesz group. Our 16th army began to feel the effects of the flank attack, which was all the more effective as our units were being reorganized and, moreover, had lost touch with the high command. This was a result of the general staff being too far removed from the fighting line. The situation became still more critical for us in that the cavalry army in the southeast continued to operate in the direction of Wuf instead of in the direction of Lublin. Unfortunately, the commandant of the Soviet front was not informed of the Polish offensive until 18th August. The commander of the 16th Army, as soon as he realized the situation, declared that retreat was necessary, with a view to reorganizing. He did not consider the Polish offensive as serious, and he was confident of his capacity to deal with it. In view, however, of subsequent information regarding the enemy's movements and the offensive on the Wiepsz, we had to take a different view of the situation. The commander of the Soviet front issued orders which altogether modified the situation of the attacking armies. On our left wing, the position was menacing. On our right wing, in consequence of the incomprehensible movements of the 4th Army, we were totally unable to deal with the enemy's attacks. Indeed, our position was extremely critical. The commander of the front's orders said, in effect, that the 4th Army should concentrate at the latest by 20th August in the region of Przasnysz Maków, helping en route the 15th Army. A dispatch from the commander of the Western Front specified that, if the help given to the 15th Army gravely retarded the progress of the 4th Army, the idea should be given up, the real aim being to concentrate in the region prescribed at the given date. The 15th and 3rd armies received the order to hold the enemy and to cover this concentration of the reserves of the 4th army. The 16th army was to retreat behind the Leviats, their left wing being covered by the Moser group. The 12th army received the order to attack, with the aim of engaging the enemy who had debouched from the Wiepsch. The 21st Division of the 3rd Army and one division of the 16th Army were obliged to make a forced march in the region of Drohichunyanov, acting as a reserve to the front. It was evident that the time lost had made us miss an opportunity of inflicting a disastrous blow upon the enemy forces while we ourselves had fallen into a critical situation. It was imperative that we should retreat. 
Knowing the nature of the fighting and of the very widespread operations of the armies, the commander of the front had no false illusions regarding a possibility of resistance or of the possible necessity of retreating as far as the grodno line. Once there, we should be reinforced by 60,000 men who were already on the road from our reserve battalions. We should be able to rest there, reorganize and return to the offensive, but the essential was to get our armies out of the present situation in good condition. In this connection, the isolation of the 4th Army was a cause for anxiety. But that was not the last of our misfortunes. Means of transport were poor, and the flighty movements of the 4th Army in the corridor of Danzig were likely to prevent its commander receiving the necessary orders in time. To crown all, the commandant of the 4th Army, isolated from the etat major of the front and the neighboring armies, and thus having no idea of the general situation, remained optimistic and considered the retreat inopportune. On the 19th August, having by chance got into communication with the commander of the front, he expressed his views, but received categorical orders. That the 4th Army, having lost so much time, was finally unable to carry out its prescribed mission on the fixed date was quite comprehensible. This fact, in addition to the disorganization of the Mozart group and to the audacity of the enemy who had learnt of our situation, condemned our 4th Army to a nearly certain defeat. One sole hope remained, that the enemy would pause to organize his forces and not push the offensive. This, however, he did not do. On the 20th August, the enemy drove back the 16th Army in disorder, attacked the flank of the 15th and 3rd Armies, and, meeting with little resistance, occupied the line Przasnysz, Maków, Ostrów, Bielsk, Bizeszcz. At that moment, our 4th Polish Army had completed the first stage of its march on Przasnysz and was in the region of Czechanów. On the 22nd August, the enemy debouched along the line Ostrowenka, Łomża, Białystok, and the 4th Army could only advance to a certain point, and no further. Our 15th and 3rd Armies made every possible effort to stop the enemy attack and to leave clear for the 4th Army the narrow passage situated between the Narev and the East Prussian frontier. But this task was impracticable. The 3rd and 15th Armies, following unequal fights in a very critical situation, lost a great number of their troops and were unable to give help to the 4th Army. The larger part of the 4th Army was assembled on the East Prussian frontier and was obliged to cross over into German territory. At this stage, the Poles, who had put all their energy into the attack, showed signs of not being able to continue their successful maneuvers. Our units, in a lamentable state, reached the line of Grodno and there rejoined their reinforcements. The work of organization then went on anew. The reinforcements were given their allotted places, and in two or three weeks the forces of the front were re-established, relatively re-established. The new troops had arrived unequipped, practically unshod, despite the rigors of the autumn. The morale of the troops, however, was good, and we considered that we had a good chance of regaining our position. The great question was, who would be ready to attack first? which of us would be in a position to take the offensive. Unhappily, the economic state of the Republic did not permit us to realize our aim. The Poles were the first to attack, and the continuation of our retreat was made inevitable. Our cavalry, which at long last had arrived in the vicinity of Lublin, was ordered by the supreme command to make a vehement attack on Zamosch, but it was too late. The essential conclusion to be drawn from our campaign of 1920 is that the result was due not to politics but to strategy. Policy had given the Red Army a difficult task, a risky and audacious one, but that is no proof that it was badly conceived. All great achievements require audacity and decision. If a comparison is made between the revolution of October 1917 and our socialist offensive in Poland, there is only one conclusion. In October, the risks were far greater than the risks in Poland. The Red Army could have accomplished the mission assigned to it, but it did not accomplish it. The essential cause of our defeat was insufficient technical preparation of troop commanders. Technical means were lacking because sufficient attention had not been paid to them. Moreover, some of our leaders were insufficiently trained. 
At the moment of the decisive attack, the fact that our western and southwestern armies were fighting almost at right angles to one another led to defeat just at the moment when the western force was engaged in the operation on the Vistula. Moreover, lack of cooperation by our fourth army tore victory from our hands and led to our catastrophe. The working classes of Eastern Europe, on hearing the news of the Soviet advance, were greatly stirred. The nationalistic catchwords invented by the Polish bourgeoisie could not mask the real fact that a class war was being waged. That feeling stirred both the proletariat and the bourgeoisie of Europe, and a revolutionary thrill ran through the world. There is not the slightest doubt that, if we had succeeded in breaking the Polish army of bourgeois and seigneurs, the revolution of the working class in Poland would have been an accomplished fact. And the tempest would not have stopped at the Polish frontier. Like a furious torrent, it would have swept over the whole of Eastern Europe. The Red Army will not forget this attempt to carry the revolution outside our frontiers. And if ever the European bourgeoisie braves us to new fights, the Red Army will crush it and spread revolution throughout Europe. Europe. Conclusion. Both Piłsudski and Tukhachevsky deny, and even resent, any analogue between the Battle of the Marne and the Battle of Warsaw. It is indeed said that only two things really stir Piłsudski, the excitement of being shot at by some assassin, and the suggestion that his strategy in August 1920 was but a copy of the French action on the Marne. Notwithstanding energetic denials by the protagonists, it remains true that the two battles on their respective widely different scales are marked by a considerable degree of similarity. In both cases the advancing troops were driven forward so fast they entered upon the final attack exhausted. Without sufficient cohesion, disconnected from their supply columns, and inadequately protected from flank attack along the whole line of communications. To adopt a racing parlance, they had been ridden into the ground. In Poland, the failure of the attack may be attributed to the omission of the high command to guard the flank. The Germans in 1914 provided a force for the purpose, but it was inadequate. The Russians in 1920 provided no flank protection whatsoever and suffered irretrievable disaster from their neglect. In the Russian case, a political object might be alleged, the ambition by surrounding Warsaw to capture the government and diplomatic corps, leading Tukhachevsky to disregard the Polish army, which he considered a negligible quantity. The Germans were pursuing not a political but a strategic object, in accordance with the traditional principle inculcated by von Moltke. The destruction of the hostile field armies, leaving the enemy's capital for subsequent treatment. In both cases, failure to concentrate on what was considered, perhaps wrongly, a minor objective led to overwhelming reverse. In one point, the battles differed. On 14th September 1914, the Allies imagined that a victorious advance was only beginning. 
The day of great maneuvers was about to dawn when cavalry, infantry, and artillery would operate in combination. No one foresaw that the N would put a stop to the advance, and that the struggle was going to develop into trench warfare with all its horror and dreariness. No one foresaw that German troops for four long years would occupy some of the richest provinces of France and hold Belgium in a stifling grip. The Battle of Warsaw knew no end. The advance of the Polish troops continued until the whole territory of Poland had been freed from the invader, until a new frontier had been won far superior to any recently in negotiation. Peace was signed, and peace has been preserved ever since. Piłsudski is probably right in refusing to accept the views of those who state that he based his action on the examples of the French commanders on the Marne. He may fairly assert that his break of contact was more deliberate, that the risk he took not only in breaking contact but in diverting troops from the defense of Warsaw in order to prepare a surprise attack is not based on anything that took place in 1914. He may therefore claim, on a more limited scale, a bolder initiative and a more clearly defined plan. As regards to Kaczewski, it might be advanced in his defense that, by the very nature of the government he served, his task was more political and less strictly military than that of the German forces in 1914. His action could therefore be defended on the ground that the prize for which he strove, though he missed it, was one of such paramount importance that it justified the taking of great risks. But such non-military considerations the god of battle ignores. In the early pages of this volume, I gave reasons for considering the Battle of Warsaw and the campaign on the Vistula, subjects worthy of impartial study. Although to some what I now say may appear idealistic and even utopian, in view of the traditional ingrained prejudices which prevail, I would add a further argument to those already advanced. It is this, the desirability, the necessity even, if the gravest difficulties are to be avoided, of improved relations between Germany and Poland, and a cessation of that animosity and hatred which has embittered the two nations for so many centuries. The most pressing task of European diplomacy is to achieve some reconciliation on Germany's eastern frontier. It is vital and urgent for German opinion to realize the indisputable truth that a stable Poland constitutes a bulwark against communism and may be considered an essential condition of European tranquility. Recent speeches made by influential leaders of the Communist Party in Moscow show that the present peace is intended by them to be merely transitory. They regard it as a breathing space, a respite before the coming war. It is also certain that, if and when war comes, it will be integral, an expression much in vogue with the Soviet, meaning that every weapon of destruction, legitimate or otherwise, will be employed, and that every device of insidious subordination will be resorted to. Bolshevism remains a relentless foe to civilization. It may be that communist doctrine, repelled by force of arms in 1920, will achieve later the disruption it seeks. But should this come to pass, it will be due less to the military strength of the Soviet, less to propaganda, however lavish and persistent, than to disunion among its adversaries and to the strange incapacity to deal effectively with the economic crisis, which is today so grave of a reproach to the intelligence of the Western world.